dedicated family man. He was the best grandpa I could ever ask for for my kids. He loved his family. He was always there for everyone. And a pillar of the community. He helped a lot of the people who were down on their luck. He was changing everyone's life. Is senselessly murdered. We noticed what looked like burn marks. Is this a torture type crime? Was he actually tortured? Detectives follow a trail of evidence. I noticed my dad's truck was gone. We knew that this truck was a key to solving this homicide. That reveals devastating betrayals. Hardy would employ people from drug rehab centers. You look at him and you're thinking that if anybody could do it, this guy could do it. Then a surprise lead reveals a killer no one imagined. I've told you guys everything I know. No, you haven't. We're pretty excited. We're just about to go nuts. It was a moment, I'll say that. I never thought he would do something like that. He's not the guy I would have picked to have committed this crime. I was in complete shock. Ardmore, Oklahoma is an honest, hardworking town built on family values. We're a town of about 25,000 people, and it's a wonderful community. It's a great place to live because you can have that large town feel and then yet come home to the small town atmosphere as well. On the evening of November 15th, 2019, that small town feeling is shattered when police respond to a 911 call. I had just sat down to eat when the phone rang and it was dispatch advising me that officers were out on a possible homicide. Police are checking in on a local man who hasn't been seen or heard from in several days. They arrived, immediately looked in the window, could see the victim was laying face down in the floor, and they could see blood. So they forced their way into the residence. They knew immediately that he was deceased. Minutes later, homicide detectives arrive at the scene. The living room was just in disarray. There was items kicked over. There was blood on the couch. There was blood spatter on nearby items in the living room, the TV and pictures. And so we knew that there was a struggle that had taken place in that room. When the detectives look at the body, they recognize the dead man. I knew the victim. It was Marty Lucas. Most of the police officers knew who Marty was. Marty helped in the community. He helped a lot of the people who were down on their luck. Marty was a, a nice guy. Detectives have to determine why 63-year-old Marty Lucas would be the target of such a heinous crime. With the amount of trauma that Marty had suffered, it was a pretty violent, bloody scene. You can see a lot of blood that has pooled around the body. You can see blood on the back of the body, on the head, and we knew that this was a death as a result of a beating or a blunt force trauma. It's obvious that there was quite a struggle. Marty had hair in his hands. He had abrasions on his hands. I think he fought for his life. We noticed that there were pieces of what appeared to be a rock that had some moss on them. We found parts of it over by the couch where there was a large blood stain, and then parts of it over by him. We walked the exterior of the residence trying to find where maybe a rock would have come from. Immediately under the carport, there is a rock pathway. The walkway was missing a rock. So immediately we thought, well, whoever it was that did this took a rock from there and brought it with him. That indicated to us that this was premeditated. And so we believed that he or she had used it as a weapon against Marty, and, and in the process of that, it was broken. We didn't find very large pieces of it, and so we believe that the, the majority of that rock was taken from the scene. Police discover unusual markings on the body. We noticed what looked like burn marks on his shirt, like his shirt had been ironed. My initial reaction was not only has he been hit by an iron, he's been burned by an iron. Is this a torture type crime? Was he actually tortured? And so we believe maybe early on that the iron could have been a murder weapon, in, or at least an additional murder weapon in this case. But what could have been the motive for such a violent attack? where his wallet would have been. Someone had reached in and taken his wallet because you could see the blood transfer, a handprint, like sliding down into his pants almost. We were pretty clear that this was a crime involving a robbery and theft. His wallet was missing along with his phones. Detectives make one more important observation. 
We thought whoever had killed Marty knew him because there wasn't a sign of forced entry. As investigators work, Marty's son Michael arrives at the scene. I went to his house. It was a nightmare. It's the worst day of my life. I was in shock once I seen what was actually inside. My husband called me. He said, my dad's dead. Someone killed him. And he was just screaming in my ear. He's like, I can't believe someone would kill my dad. I was in complete shock. He was such a nice person. Who would want to hurt him? Marty Lucas was born into a military family in 1956. After graduating high school, Marty got married and had two children, Jennifer and Michael. Michael and his dad were very, very close. He loved his family. He was always there for everyone, you know. He made sure to make time for everyone. I used to call him Papa Smurf because he's just really funny. He's short. He's just a real, you know, bubbly person. My parents, they divorced when I was pretty young. Marty had struggles when my husband was a child and a teenager. He had a substance abuse problem. He had been in and out of trouble with the police, petty crimes that was a result of that addiction. In 2007, Marty got a second chance when he was offered a job as a carpenter and found renewed purpose in life. From then on, he straightened up and started his own business, did really well. He turned his life around. He was one of the few success stories that I'm aware of in my career. Marty threw everything into rebuilding his life and his family. He taught me a lot of work-related skills at an early age. He let me start working with him when I was 12 years old. And my son, he's eight. He's already starting working him, basically, showing him skills like he did me when I was young. He was the best grandpa I could ever ask for for my kids. Marty never forgot the second chance he'd been given and vowed to pay it forward. Marty would usually go to the halfway houses and get people that had just got out of jail or they have a hard time with their life and see if they would want to work for him. Basically, just giving workers second chances. He knew where they was coming from. He's been in their shoes. He taught these men and women new skills. He treated them with the utmost respect. Now investigators are left asking, who would want to bludgeon this well-respected contractor and caring grandfather to death? He really had no enemies. And just to see that the way that he died was so brutal, it was very difficult to know that someone would be capable of doing something like that. As detectives finish up at the crime scene, they turn to Marty's son, who gives them a crucial lead. When I showed up, I noticed that my dad's truck was gone. That really threw me off, because he wouldn't even let me drive his truck. He wouldn't loan the truck out to no one. It was a Chevy pickup that originally had belonged to Marty's father. That truck was everything to him. Detectives put out a bolo, or be on the lookout for the missing truck. We needed to find the truck and maybe hope that either the suspect was still driving it or that they left behind evidence that we could identify him. We knew that this truck was a key to solving this homicide. Investigators ask Marty's loved ones who they think would have seen him last. We found out that Marty had been missing two or three days prior to the Friday the 15th that we found his body. And one of the things we were told by family and friends is that Marty goes to this Valero gas station every morning to get coffee. The Valero had video that pointed down the street that the crime occurred on. The manager said that Marty had arrived last at that store on Tuesday morning. Detectives search the security footage. On the day after Marty was last seen alive and three days before his body was found, the truck appears. Marty's truck was very unique, dark green color with custom wheels. This green truck was in a big hurry, and it pulled out in front of a semi-truck, and it was almost in an accident that we had captured on video. Investigators need to track down Marty's truck and whoever is behind the wheel. We thought if we find the truck, we're probably going to find our suspect. This is going to be our guy. Coming up, detectives uncover suspects with dark pasts. They said, be violent. I thought, good lord, he gets violent. I don't know what I'm going to do. <laughs> she had frequented in a lot of the local casinos. She knew he had large sums of cash. <laughs> this was the break that we needed. And the trail leads to an unlikely killer. 
that you're not going to think that this is someone who could kill somebody. And that kind of broke open a whole new layer of the case. The investigation took off at warp speed because we think we've got our guy. Police investigating the murder of 63-year-old contractor Marty Lucas have obtained gas station surveillance video of someone driving his truck the day after he was last seen. We collected hours and hours of video from the store. We were able to piece together some events that happened before and after the homicide. The footage shows a busy street a few blocks from Marty's house. When detectives scour the rest of the security tapes, something grabs their attention. On Wednesday morning, just after daylight, you can see a gentleman walking from the direction of Motel 6. And that person was walking towards Marty's home. Is this unidentified man involved in Marty's murder? You can see the suspect. Then an hour later, you can see on the video that there's one guy in the truck, that there's a single person in the truck. And so we thought he might be the same person that was in that video. Marty did not allow just anyone to drive this truck. In fact, he did not allow anyone to drive this truck. We had to follow the stolen truck. That was really going to be our key to solving this case. While officers continue their search for the truck, detectives return to speak to Marty's family and friends. That's one of the things we were trying to just nail down is, who has Marty been hanging out with lately? Who has he been working with? Who has he had problems with, if anyone? Police learn that along with helping people back up on their feet, Marty often forged friendships with those he employed. Marty would become close with some of the men that he worked with or that he would hire and try to get to know them. There's probably about six or seven of them I actually got pretty close to. He built up friendships with them. Amanda and Jason, Marty's neighbors, were very close to him. Amanda used to work for Marty because she paints very well. He didn't look down on me for, you know, I was trying to get my life back on track. And he told me, he, you know, he did it, so you can do it. Marty would bring a lot of these folks to family dinners or get together. He tried to bring them into his family. But now, police want to know, had Marty's generosity and business exposed him to danger? He paid all of his people in cash. And that's just the way it is in the day labors with those guys. Uh, they, need, they need money that day, so they're going to work. And everything's cash. To know that he could pay them daily with cash and help them out may have led to his demise. Police also discover not all Marty's employees felt like part of the family. It wasn't an easy road for Marty because sometimes he would have to tell them that they couldn't work for him anymore because they would steal from him. Anytime you're working with people who have drug and alcohol problems, it's not uncommon for them to steal from their employers. And Marty had faced some of that. He wasn't afraid to stand up to these people. He would tell them, if you, you know, if you mess up, you're gone. So our list of suspects was a mile long. We were given several names, but yeah, it was so difficult for investigators because it was going to be hard to track them down. Where they were staying, they usually don't keep jobs very long. As detectives begin tracking down Marty's current and former employees, they ask his neighbor if anyone had a grudge against him. Well, I initially went to interview Amanda, and she said, you know, over the last month or so, there's been some rough-looking characters over there. One month before his death, he had been hanging out with these new people, and they were helping him work on his truck and then had to redo the job. She thought maybe there had been some anger issues between the victim and those guys. The day they were there working, Marty seemed to be pacing back and forth like they were taking too long, and he didn't want to, you know, leave them at his house. They were making too big of a mess. He was upset about that. Amanda didn't know the men but it overheard Marty talk to the man in charge. One was a guy named Junior, and so this was someone that we wanted to speak with. There's just one problem. We did not know who Junior was. We knew this to be probably a nickname, and that's all we really knew. While detectives plan to search for Junior, Amanda also provides them with the name of another one of Marty's former employees. Marty met Chris Dyer at Valero, the local convenience store that he went to nearly every morning to get a cup of coffee.
Chris had recently been fired from that store, had a falling out with the owner, and Marty had employed him. I know Chris Dyer had worked for Marty, had been fired from there for drug use. He'd had a criminal past. He'd been arrested and had an addiction problem with drugs and alcohol. Officers speak with the owner of the Valero station where Chris once worked. The owner manager of the Valero store reaffirmed that Chris was just not a very good guy, that he had had trouble employing him. And so he felt like that he needed to let Chris go because there was always drama, that Chris was basically just at rock bottom and desperate for money. Chris Dyer knew that Marty carried several hundred dollars when he paid him for a job. He would pay him at the end of the day, and he would pay him with cash. Was Chris Dyer desperate enough to bludgeon Marty Lucas to death? We were thinking that maybe it was a robbery gone bad, knowing that Marty had this money in his home because he was down on his luck and needed money for drugs. And so there was a lot of questions concerning Chris Dyer. One of our main priorities early on in the investigation is to find this subject named Junior, along with Chris Dyer, and so we, we wanted to talk to these people. So we need to locate Junior, and we needed to talk to Chris as quickly as possible. Police investigating the murder of contractor Marty Lucas are chasing multiple leads as they search for his killer and stolen truck. They've set their sights on two of Marty's employees, an unidentified man called Junior, and a recently fired laborer named Chris Dyer. A lot of these folks who are going through tough times, there is nothing permanent in their lives. There is nothing fixed in their lives. There is no stability. And so it was hard to track them down. Following a lead, police questioned employees at the gas station where Chris had worked. I spoke with the clerk that was on duty at the Valero. And she was able to give me a phone number to Gina Dyer. Gina is Chris's estranged wife. She and Chris had been separated about a month because she had caught him cheating. He had gone back to drug use, and that he was currently living at the Econo Lodge Hotel. Detectives find Chris at the hotel and bring him in for an interview. We really thought that we had something. We knew that Chris had easy access to Marty's home. Chris Dyer knew that Marty carried up to five to six hundred dollars in cash on him at, at any given point in time. So there's a rumor that um, some rumors went around that maybe you and him had gotten crossways and he had basically fired you. So you never had a disagreement? No, not at all. Nope. And I'd like to know who in the hell saying that because that's bullshit. <laughs> Pardon my French. Police know better than to trust Chris's word. We knew that Chris Dyer is down on his look and had run-ins with the law, and well, maybe this is our killer. This is who it is. And then you get him in an interview room, and he's cooperative, and he's genuine. In fact, he was very distraught over Marty's death. I hope he catches who the hell did it and fry their ass. Yeah, I know, right? But he was a man. That guy would do anything for anybody. He had some empathy there because he'd been in trouble before, too. And damn sure, damn sure didn't deserve to go out like that. I think he considered Marty a friend, even though Marty had fired him. Would you be willing for us to, to go through your truck, look through your truck, look through your hotel room, to see yeah, if there's yeah. anything that would be yeah, I got that we can roll you out? Marty had what we would consider defensive wounds to the hands. There was hair and blood under the fingernails of the body. And so we knew that there was some type of altercation. We knew that there had to be injuries on our suspect or suspects. And Chris had none of that. He had no recent cuts or bruises. In order to officially rule Chris out as a suspect, detectives check Chris's alibi. He said he had gone to Kingston, Oklahoma, which is nearby with Krista, his girlfriend. I believe it was the Wednesday before. Police bring Krista in for an interview. Is it possible that he slipped out of the room one night uh, while you were sleeping, left, did, went and did something? Uh, no. I have to have to say that just could not be possible. His girlfriend also corroborated Chris's timeline as to what his story was. He had an alibi for that timeline, but he just didn't appear to be involved. With nothing to link Chris to the murder, police are forced to let him go. 
Investigators hope Marty's preliminary autopsy report will provide more leads. The significant thing for us from the autopsy was the fact of the cause of death. It was blunt force trauma to the head, including the large gash to his head. Obviously, he was hit with something other than the rock because of the laceration on his head and because of the burn marks. These burns that was on his back and part of his right arm came back as a post-mortem burns, which was very interesting to us, which means that they were caused after Marty had passed away. Initially, we were looking at these burns to the body as being type of a torture. Now, we believe the iron was used as a secondary weapon after. So the suspect didn't realize that. In his rage, he didn't know that Marty had already died, and he continued to hit him with this iron. The preliminary autopsy report doesn't conclude whether the rock or iron ultimately killed Marty, and an exact time of death remains undetermined. Meanwhile, with the killer still at large, the worry takes a toll on Marty's family. His son, Michael's always a quiet person, but he was like a walking zombie. I couldn't sleep at night. I'd stay up during the day. It's fear for my family. Uh, just because, like, I had no clue who would do this to my dad. Michael was really panicked. Marty had so many different men working with him. I was very fearful of my life. As police continue their search for other suspects, including the former employee, Junior, who worked on Marty's truck, a lead comes in about someone close to Marty who might have had a motive. One of Marty's friends had called one of our patrol officers and told him that Marty was dating a lady named Donna Hargrave. So Donna Hargrave is somebody that probably everybody at the Armour Police Department is familiar with and knows on site. We knew Donna had a drug problem as well. She did have a few run-ins with police and frequented a lot of the local casinos. Could Donna's vices have pushed her to murder Marty? She knew Marty and knew that he had large sums of cash, and because she is a known drug user, that perhaps she had enlisted the assistance of another known drug user to go rob Marty. That was a scenario obviously had some possibility to it. That's why we needed to talk to Donna as quickly as possible. Officers bring Donna down to the police department for an interview. Upon bringing her into the interview room, she was handcuffed, and I knew that she had not come up there willingly. What's this about? Yes, if I'm not under arrest, then why do y'all have a reason to search me? She was really uncooperative. She did not want to speak to us. OK, what is this about? Please get this over here and tell me what this is about. OK, so. Somebody uh, who I've been hanging with. Yeah. OK, who? Marty Lucas. I that people That's straight up. She definitely has a problem with Marty that was very suspicious. And it really struck a nerve in us because we wanted to know what this problem is. Two days after finding the body of 63-year-old Marty Lucas, police are interviewing his former girlfriend, Donna Hargrave, a woman with a long criminal history and a grudge against Marty. She had been arrested many times here in Ardmore. She had been known to be at least uncooperative with police, if not somewhat violent and unruly. She didn't really care too much for Marty. We thought maybe she had something to do with his, with his death. He pissed me off because he was just being a dickhead. So when you said him, what were you mad at him about? He just promised things and don't ever fall through. Like I talked to Marty about, about moving my trailer over to him. over to his house or something. He said no. He knew that she had not been clean and that she had not been trying to straighten up and that he wasn't going to help her as long as she wasn't trying to help herself. Could Marty's rejection have led Donna to do something unthinkable? So if I were to tell you something bad happened to Marty, what would you say? What do you mean? What's wrong with him? Well. If I were to tell you he was dead, someone did something to him, what would you say about that? Are you serious? <laughs> yeah.
Yeah, that's that's why you're here. It's... This was a girl that was very hardened, and for her to break down and to cry, and was very genuinely upset over Marty's death. She did say that they had recently broken up and that she hadn't seen him any time in the last four, five, seven days. Can you kind of start like maybe Wednesday morning, tell me where you were, what you did, where'd you, where you went? At my mom's and I slept all day. Okay. And we were able to pretty quickly corroborate where she had been. It was unlikely that she had anything to do with his death. However, we did not rule her out immediately. Days after Marty's gruesome death, his family and friends come together to say their goodbyes. Marty's funeral was amazing. It was very, very sad, though, because everyone who knew him knew that he didn't deserve anything ever bad to happen to him. Everyone loved Marty, everyone. There was quite a bit of his workers, even his past workers, that come to his funeral. It was a good day, but a bad day at the same time. Meanwhile, police doggedly follow each and every lead. We did have a large suspect pool because we didn't know who all might have been working for Marty. One of the things that we wanted to get identified was who Junior was that was working on the truck. So myself and another investigator said, we'll run by the halfway houses and see if we can get Junior identified. So we went over to the Broadway house, and the director there gave us the name of Clarence Bibb Jr. He said he thought Junior was from up by Oklahoma City, and he's got a pretty extensive record, including some assault. Well, we, we really believe that if Junior and Marty had gotten into an altercation over the payment of the truck motor, maybe he took the money, it got out of hand, he killed Marty, took Marty's money and the truck, and took it back to Oklahoma City to chop it up. We found that law enforcement there knew Clarence very well. They knew his family very well. And they lived in several homes that would be described as a compound, like a family compound. And they said, don't go out there without a lot of us. Clarence is violent, and so you don't go up there by yourself. Detectives assemble a task force with local and state police and make the two-hour drive to Junior's compound. When I first got out there, I thought, man, this is a real possibility. Man, we might find our truck out here. So we went up and knocked on the door. And when Clarence showed up, I thought, good Lord, this is one large man. And if he gets violent, I don't know what I'm going to do. <laughs> you look at him and you see what had happened to Marty, you're thinking that if anybody could do it, this guy could do it. I mean, he's big. Detectives ask if he and Marty had fallen out over the work Junior had done on Marty's truck. And he was happy with what Marty had paid him, and there was no disagreement. He said that Marty paid him $500 more than he was supposed to because of the trouble that we went through. And in fact, when I told him that Marty had died and that someone had caused his death, he too got emotional. Here, this big, mean, gruff country guy, and he's crying like a child over his friend's death. He said, you know, I wouldn't hurt Marty if somebody paid me to. He said he considered Marty a mentor and a friend. Clarence denied that he had been in Ardmore recently. He had gave an alibi that he had been at home with his mom and other family members around the time of Marty's death. And they corroborated his story that he was there. He fully cooperated with the investigation. He gave us his cell phone. He let us have clothing and boots. He let us search his house. He let us search the property. And I mean, he let us just have free reign of whatever we wanted. And we came up with nothing. I just remember thinking to myself, man, we are absolutely going nowhere with this investigation. With nothing to link Junior to the homicide, detectives begin to fear the investigation is cooling down. We had a pretty good idea that it wasn't Junior at that point. Donna Hargrave had a stone-clad alibi. Chris Dyer just didn't appear to be involved. I think both Bryce and I just were disheartened. We had no leads. We had no suspects. So we were just trying to figure out where do we go from here. Then an unexpected call turns the case red hot. Well, we got back to the station, and dispatch yells down to us, hey, they found your truck. We were dead tired, but you went from, you went from dead tired to wide awake in a hurry. into the investigation of Marty Lucas's murder, 
Detectives get the break they were looking for, Marty's missing truck. And I remember the dispatcher telling me they found the truck. And I said, where is it? And they said, in Springdale, Arkansas. And so this was the break that we needed. We're pretty excited. And we're just about to go nuts. We're like, OK, get a hold of Springdale police. Get them on the phone. Let's find out what we got going on. It was a moment, I'll, I'll say that. Investigators ask Springdale police how Marty's truck had ended up over 300 miles away. A citizen had called and told them that his friend had been in possession of the truck. And his friend, he identified as Jack Latham. But who is Jack Latham? Detectives immediately ask Marty's family if they know the name. They learned Jack was one of Marty's most trusted laborers who hadn't been seen or heard from in months. Jack Latham, he worked for my dad for a long time. He was a really hard worker. Marty was extremely good to Jack. He gave him extra money here and there whenever he'd need it. Marty would bring him by my house sometimes, and they would occasionally ride around together. He seemed very quiet. It was not unusual for people to come and go in Marty's business. Jack Latham worked for him on and off a couple of years prior to this. When detectives dig into Jack's background, they learn he has a daughter and ex-wife in Ardmore and a checkered past. He had an extensive criminal history for drugs and theft, but he's not the guy I would have picked to have committed this crime. Jack Latham did minor misdemeanor type crimes, drug possession type crimes, but this is not a person that would even be on the radar because he had no really violent history. So you're not going to think that this is a guy who could kill somebody, particularly not in the manner in which Marty was killed. Investigators rush to Arkansas, where police have taken Jack into custody and seized the truck. But before speaking with Jack, they interview the man who first contacted police about the truck, Jack's friend, Raymond. Raymond, he says to us that out of the blue, Jack calls on Friday night and says that he has got court on Monday. Can he stay or the weekend? Raymond tells police Jack asked to get picked up at a local parking lot. So he goes to pick him up, and he sees he's sitting in a what looks like a pretty nice Chevy pickup. And he says, hey, you know, whose pickup is that? He said, oh, it's a guy that I'm visiting. He let me come sit in it to wait on you. And he says to us, I didn't believe him. Monday morning, Jack says, just take me to jail. I've got warrants. So he takes him to jail, and then he goes back home, and he looks to see what the warrants are for, and it's for theft. And he thinks, I wonder if that truck's stolen, because something doesn't feel right with that truck. So he goes back to where the parking lot where the truck is and sees it doesn't have tags on it. And so Raymond knew that Jack was lying. He knew he needed to call the police. We went and looked at the truck, and the truck looked pristine on the inside. But when we sprayed it with Blue Star, there was blood everywhere. We knew in the back of our minds that this was the key, that Jack Latham was the key to Marty Lucas's death. And then the investigation took off at warp speed because, yeah, we think we've got our guy. We went to the Benton County Jail and interviewed Jack that day. First thing I noticed about him is he's slight of build. He's not very big. He seems to be very reserved and meek. He doesn't seem to be what I would picture to be a killer. Then police noticed something else about Jack's appearance. He looked pretty bad. He had some injuries to his face. He had this greenish brown black eye or injury to his eye. He had some a minor abrasion to his lip. Could Jack have suffered his injuries while attacking his former boss, Marty? Police start by asking Jack when he was in Ardmore last. OK, um, I guess at some point in time, you've been in Ardmore, been around Ardmore, or lived in Ardmore or something. Yeah, a long time ago, about six years ago. Jack tells detectives he's recently been living 200 miles away in Enid, Oklahoma. Who were you staying with? Uh, my brother and him. Then, investigators cut to the chase. We've been working on an investigation for the last uh, almost a week now. Your name's come up. And before I can really get into a lot of questions with you and details and explain to you, you know, why we're here and all that, um, i got to read your Miranda rights. After we Mirandized him, he said he didn't want to talk to us anymore. Do you wish to make a statement, or will you answer any questions that we have for you today? No. No? OK. With Jack refusing to talk, police need to find a way to place him near Marty's house at the time of the murder. So in his initial interview, he tells us that he hasn't been to Ardmore, that he came down here from his brother's house in Enid. I called Enid PD, and 
They went out, they talked with the brother, they talked with the brother's wife. They said, yes, he has been here at our house. But then detectives get a stunning piece of information Jack hadn't shared. His brother's wife said, I'd put him on the bus to go see his wife and daughter in Ardmore on the Monday morning before Marty had been killed. So we knew he had gotten to Ardmore. We, the next day, we got a hold of the bus and found out that, yes, indeed, he had been at Ardmore. With Jack still in custody, police drive back to Ardmore. The detectives got a search warrant and looked through Jack's phone, and that led them to his ex-wife and daughter. Did you see your dad in the truck mm -hmm. last week? No. Okay. Do you understand what kind of trouble your dad's possibly in? He's been detained as a suspect in a homicide. Mm -hmm. So you for sure haven't seen your dad since he's been in our mm -hmm. Investigators talk to Jack's ex-wife, Teresa, next. Has he came to visit you lately? No. But I haven't seen from him or heard from him. So would it surprise you to know that Jack is involved in a homicide here in Ardmore? Yeah, because it, it doesn't seem like him. Both of them said they haven't seen Jack. He hadn't been in Ardmore. They don't know what we're talking about. And we knew this was not true because on Jack's phone, we knew that he had called Teresa and Shelby. And during that interview with Teresa, I laid it out for her. I just flat out told her I knew she was lying. I'm not saying anything. I've told you guys everything I know. No, you haven't. It's all right. No, you haven't. And we can prove it. It's a matter of time before we put you in that truck. We put you in that truck, it, it starts getting serious in, in a real quick hurry. Police start to question if Jack's ex-wife and daughter are involved in Marty's murder. At that point, she decided that she didn't want to talk to us anymore, and she and Shelby left. And I just told her, we're not going to stop. We're going to solve this crime with or without you. The only question is, what's your role going to be? Less than 24 hours later, police get a call. The next day, early morning, the next morning, Teresa called, said, I want to come back and talk. So from that, I mean, that, that kind of broke open a whole new layer of the case. Police investigating the murder of Marty Lucas are trying to place his friend and employee, Jack Latham, at the scene of the crime. We knew that he was coming here to visit his wife and daughter. They both told investigators that they did not know where Jack was. They had not seen Jack. He had not been in Ardmore. But Jack's daughter and ex-wife returned to the police station the next day. Yesterday, you were pretty far. She didn't know nothing. I was really scared and I thought about it all night and I felt really bad. Really hit home, so I had to tell the truth. I did see Jack on the 11th and 12th. Which was what, Monday and Tuesday? Monday and Tuesday. Okay. And he dropped us off at my mom's house on the 13th in the morning. Teresa says Jack stayed at an Ardmore motel on Monday and Tuesday nights. They said Jack had called Marty to see if he had any work for him. And Marty said, no, I, I can't use you. I don't need you right now. And do you know what day that was? Tuesday night. They both said that about 8 or 8.30 on that Wednesday morning, Jack left, sent an officer to Motel 6 to see if they had video. And sure enough, we've got video of Jack Latham leaving Motel 6, wearing the same clothes as the person that's walking. The Bolero camera picks up. About an hour later, a green Chevrolet truck that we believe was Marty's truck shows up in the parking lot in Motel 6. You watch him go over to a dumpster, throw something in the dumpster, which we believe was the rock and the iron. Where did he go get the truck? He said he's going to get it to me. Then Jack did something even more suspicious. When he came in, he went straight to the sink and washed his hands. He, uh, he did wipe his face down, and he put his hoodie on. And he told me that he did something bad, but he wouldn't tell me what. He said, we got to leave. we got to get out of here. He drops them off, and they don't see him again. And so by then, yeah, we got enough to file charges on Jack Lake. I called the family members and told them what we knew. I was very shocked because Jack had been in my house around my children. He just acted very shy, but he didn't act like he would hurt anyone. 
It was shocking to me because he treated Jack with respect like he did everyone else. Police charged Jack Latham with first degree murder and extradite him from Arkansas. When he arrives in Ardmore, Jack starts talking. Jack told me that he was in desperate need of money, that he, he had no job, that he needed money for drugs. And he knew that Marty Lucas was the source of that money. Marty had told him no, that he knew that he wasn't clean. His story was that a physical altercation occurred, that he took a rock paperweight from the kitchen table, struck Marty with it, that, in his words, he freaked out, took the keys to the truck and a few hundred dollars from the wallet and left the area. Jack denies attacking Marty with a stone from outside or the iron. There were some aspects where he seemed to truly be confused about what had happened because he was strung out on drugs, including was there an iron used? So what had really happened? Police have their own theory as to how the murder played out. We believe that this was premeditated. I think he went to Marty's house, and I think he picked that rock up on the outside of the house and he knocked on the door, because I don't think he was going to take no for an answer. And when Marty told him no, a fight ensued in which he struck Marty with the rock. Uh, I think Marty fought back. He struck him with the iron, which was readily available, and then burned him with it, whether on purpose or on accident. He took the iron and he took the rock with him, and he disposed of the evidence, and he drove to Arkansas. It was absolutely senseless over a few hundred dollars. Despite the evidence, prosecutors worry defense lawyers will try to argue Jack was desperate and never planned to kill Marty. I thought that this case met the elements from a legal standpoint of first degree murder, but then you have to be mindful of the fact that a jury would think also Jack's explanation is somewhat believable. He's a hopeless junkie. He's desperate for money. With the family's consent, prosecutors charged Jack with second degree murder. We didn't want to risk going to trial and then letting him free. In October 2020, Jack Latham pleads guilty and is sentenced to 25 years in prison. I feel like we got justice. I know he's going to be locked up and my family is going to be safe. Jack was very unexpected as a killer because he just didn't act like he was that type of person. Jack Latham, he's, he's still a mystery to me, you know, because just by being around him, I never thought he would do something like that. He did this for nothing. There was no reason for nothing. Marty was such a nice guy. But not only that, I mean, think of all the people whose lives he affected in a positive way. That's a sense of loss for our community. When I lost Marty, I lost my life, too. He was the most amazing person I could ever. Sorry. Despite Marty's horrific death, the legacy of his compassion lives on. My dad, he'd be very proud of the lives that he's changed in the community. It made me appreciate everything about Marty and the second chances he gave to everybody because it made me feel like I should give people second chances. A gregarious young man just months away from his wedding day. He was always happy. All he wanted in life was to have a family, work hard, and fall in love. Has his future viciously ripped away? It was evident. The young man had been bludgeoned. It hurt me so much, and I lost it. I lost it. Investigators are sent down a rabbit hole of suspects. He was violently jealous. He's a significant drug dealer. It looked like that he may have been kidnapped. They were accompanying a very scared-looking Hispanic young man. Before a shocking revelation, what he was describing was more like something off of a TV show. Turns the case on its head. What he did to us changed our life forever. It was a shock to all of us. It came as an absolute surprise. He had no remorse, he had no guilt. He's a monster. Cornelius. A small town in northern Oregon 
nestled among picturesque orchards. Cornelius is a longtime farming community. It's a very kind of nice, sort of sleepy place. It's kind of a little bedroom community. It's mostly a blue collar town, working class. The calm of Cornelius is shaken one quiet morning with the reported disappearance of 20-year-old Gonzalo Pisano Guzman. That morning, my mom saw that Gonzalo's bed was made, like no one slept there. So she obviously got all concerned and he didn't come home last night. And then my mom tells me to go to the police station with Sol to report him missing. His fiance, Sol, and his sister, Juana, had been actively looking for him that day. That morning, the family contacted his place of employment. He had not shown up for work. The family was extremely distraught by this disappearance. He doesn't miss work without calling in. They couldn't reach him by pager or by telephone. And we're all freaking out because this is not who he is and what he does. It's so odd, it's not normal. We learned that Saul had seen Gonzalo the night before. They had visited with each other until about quarter after nine that evening, and Saul reported seeing him leaving in his car alone, headed home. But he did not return home last night. To aid the detectives, Saul provides a description of what Gonzalo was wearing when she last saw him. He had on an athletic top with some numbers on it, and specifically uh, two gold chains. While Juana and Saul speak with police, other family members frantically look for Gonzalo. We all went different ways in our cars, driving around just to see if we found his car. We were trying to look for anything. My dad thought, you know, maybe he got in an accident. We were desperate. We just wanted a clue. Around 4 or 5 o'clock in the afternoon, we all started feeling like, OK, something's wrong now. On the outskirts of town, Gonzalo's father makes a disturbing discovery. My dad spotted the car in an empty field. When he saw the car, the white car, the, he knew right away that was Gonzalo's car. He found the car burned up. He rushed to the car, opened up the car, and didn't find any body. So once that happened, it was just nuts. Where is he at? Did he get kidnapped? He's dead. It was even worse. Detectives arrive and search for signs of what happened to Gonzalo. The car was uh, totally destroyed by fire. It appeared that the car had been heavily doused with accelerant, probably gasoline. Somebody was clearly trying to cover up evidence from inside that vehicle. There was no evidence of any body. There were zip ties found near the car. As far as the scene was concerned, it yielded minimal clues. As the car had been burned completely, uh, the chances of DNA or blood or fingerprints uh, were greatly reduced. Later that afternoon, another chilling discovery is made just 11 miles away. A citizen had seen something that looked like a dead body in the ditch on her road. The body was found about a 15, 20 minute drive from where the burned car was. This young man matched both the physical description, the clothing, and the jewelry. At this point, there was no doubt that this was Gonzalo. It was clearly a homicide. Uh, there was evidence of bullet wounds on the body and what appeared to be repeated knife blows to the heart. We also discovered some injuries to the back of the head, and it was evident the young man had been bludgeoned. It was apparent that he uh, died a violent death. We felt almost immediately that this was very personal in nature. There was no phone and there was no wallet at the scene, but he still had his jewelry with him, which were gold. So the thought of this being a robbery was off the table pretty quickly. There was another motive here. There were zip ties found near the body, and they matched the zip ties from the scene of the car. One of the things that went through my head was had someone brought zip ties to restrain Gonzalo? We also located four spent casings from a 40 caliber semi-automatic pistol. After finishing up at the crime scene, police are faced with the difficult task 
of delivering the devastating news to Gonzalo's family. The police came early in the morning. I opened the door and they told me, we found your brother, uh, but unfortunately he's dead. I was in shock. I heard my mom screaming. It was something I never want to hear again. It's, it's not even a scream. It's a pain so deep that only moms, only moms know what that is. I found out that he, he was murdered. And I lost it. I lost it. Era gritar, llora. Algo tan fuerte que todavía de mi mente no se ha acabado. To know that such an amazing person was taken away. He didn't deserve to die that way. Bottom line is, I don't have my brother anymore. Born in Mexico in 1979, Gonzalo had a playful spirit. He loved to dance, he loved music. Always a smile, always caring, and always joking around with people. Gonzalo era un muchacho alegre. Y llegaba, me abrazaba, y, y siempre quería bailar conmigo. When the family moved to the United States in 1989, outgoing Gonzalo settled in quickly. He was very charming. He was really good looking. He was popular with the girls. So he was always asked to be in quinceañeras, which is a traditional, you know, uh, party for us Mexicans when you turn 15. In 1998, Gonzalo met Marisol Mora at a party, and the teenagers quickly fell in love. De que estaba muy enamorado de, de Marisol. Marisol era el amor de su vida de Gonzalo. Era, era todo para él. Todo. It was that genuine love and happiness. There was a light in him. He was a completely different person, a happy, full person. And all he wanted in life was to have a family, work hard, and fall in love. After a whirlwind romance, Gonzalo proposed to Marisol. So the wedding was set to be in September. That was just a couple of months after he was murdered. We have a big family, so it was going to be a big deal. But instead of a wedding, Gonzalo's loved ones are left heartbroken and grieving. While his family plans a funeral, detectives are digging into the work of this homicide case. This case was puzzling. There really didn't seem to be a strong motive as to why this young man was murdered. Everything was going good in his life. He was responsible. He wasn't involved in gangs. He's just very well-liked, very upbeat, and just a trustworthy young man. It was really difficult. There were still so many unanswered questions, and we had no definitive leads as to who would have caused this or who we were looking for. The fact that there was still a killer out there to me, it was very ominous. This is very grim. We needed to really look into who was responsible for this. Coming up, investigators uncover a menacing grudge. He held an extreme dislike for Gonzalo. He was determined to have Gonzalo killed. The knife wounds directed at the heart did speak of extreme animosity. And leads them to discover a web of alarming secrets and lies. She wasn't in love with Gonzalo and he wasn't in love with her. She admitted it was all a lie. He saw skinheads in the vehicle. And that's when we really started to think something was wrong. Before the truth blindsides everyone. I was like in shock. It was so senseless. It was so senseless. In the town of Cornelius, Oregon, police are investigating the vicious murder of 20-year-old Gonzalo Pisano Guzman. Wanting more details about his last known movements, detectives speak to his fiance, Saul. She described in detail how Gonzalo had come to her house on the night of the 6th, that they sat out front on the porch. They were discussing their plans for the upcoming wedding and going over a guest list. 
Uh, she stated that following the conversation that he left around nine o'clock. She stated while they were sitting on the porch that her cousin Jaime and a friend Eddie were playing in the in the garage of the house, uh, apparently uh, shooting baskets. That led us to believe that these two young fellows may have been the last known persons to see Gonzalo alive. So it was important that we interview them. Investigators bring Jaime and Eddie into the sheriff's office. During the interview, both stated that uh, they had to get to work that night and approached Gonzalo as he was getting in his car and asked if they could get a ride. They were running late for work. They worked on a janitorial crew run by Saul's brother, Rafael. They had to be at work in Hillsboro at the Hawthorne Farms Fitness Center at 10 o'clock. They said Rafael picked them up and took them to work at the athletic club, and that eventually they got off at about 4.30 in the morning. The fact that they both gave the same statement actually provided themselves an alibi. They did not offer any conflict that they had with Gonzalo. They indicated that they had uh, no reason to, to hurt him. To corroborate Jaime and Eddie's alibi, police speak to their boss, Saul's brother, Rafael. We interviewed him at his house. He was very cooperative, very smooth, very polite, had his own business, a young entrepreneur. Rafael was an incredibly self-possessed 19-year-old. Uh, he had created a janitorial service. Although he was very young, had a very good contract, had his own cleaning company, and appeared to be very successful. Detectives ask him to confirm Jaime and Eddie's story. He confirmed that he had picked them up at Eddie's house and drove them to work. He confirmed their story that they had worked cleaning the health club that night. He said that he was at the athletic club until about four in the morning. So Raphael, in effect, corroborates Eddie and Jaime's version of events on the night of the 6th. So we kind of set them aside. With Jaime and Eddie alibi, investigators turned to the autopsy report, hoping to find new leads. It became very apparent just how violently he had died. The medical examiner did find three blunt force blows uh, to his skull. The autopsy also showed that he had been shot five times. And then he had also been stabbed five times, very brutally, in the area of the heart. The close cluster of the knife wounds directed at the heart did speak of extreme animosity, some violent emotion. The gunshot wounds made it appear that his hands were up in a defensive gesture. Gonzalo was likely pleading for some measure of mercy and uh, ultimately none was to be had. The autopsy report also determines that Gonzalo's death occurred around 10 p.m. With the findings in hand, investigators now turn to Gonzalo's workplace, searching for possible suspects. We interviewed his supervisor. Gonzalo's boss described him as reliable, steady worker, punctual. As detectives dig deeper, they learn about a startling new side to Gonzalo that he had a relationship with one of the security guards that worked there. Gonzalo's boss did tell us there may have been some possible involvement between the security guard, Bobette, and Gonzalo. So we needed to look into it. We needed to interview her. Police bring Bobette, Gonzalo's alleged girlfriend, in for questioning. She was very upset about his death. She was very emotional, very distraught about finding out that Gonzalo had been murdered and ultimately disclosed that, in fact, uh, she had had a very intimate relationship with Gonzalo for a couple months, but she made it very clear she wasn't in love with Gonzalo and he wasn't in love with her. Bobette described her relationship with Gonzalo as kind of a fling. It was kept secret. She understood that he was engaged to be married, but it crossed our minds that maybe Bobette's feelings were stronger than she let on. Maybe she did not want this wedding to go forward. The wedding was planned for September, only a few months away. Police asked Gonzalo's co-worker about her movements on the day of the murder. Bobette had been at several different locations that day. 
uh, running errands, and she had receipts to support that. So she was ruled out as a suspect. But while Bobette's cleared of suspicion, she hands detectives a crucial tip. Bobette mentioned an ex-boyfriend named Oscar Rodriguez. She told us Oscar was quite jealous. He was extraordinarily jealous, apparently had been violently jealous in the past. About four days before the murder, Oscar had found out about her relationship with Gonzalo. He became infuriated and began accusing her of cheating on him. That could be a motive for Gonzalo's murder, so Oscar became a lead suspect. Only two days into the investigation of the vicious murder of Gonzalo Pisano Guzman, police discover he was involved with his co-worker, Bobette. Now she's pointed the finger at her jealous ex, Oscar Rodriguez. She speculated that maybe he had something to do with it. We looked into him. He had a criminal history. He'd been pretty extensively involved in gangs at that point in his life, and he was well known to the local police very much an impulsive young man that was also involved in drug activity and drug use. Bobette told us that this was a relationship she had to escape from. She personally felt threatened by his presence and his behavior. And she was very worried that perhaps he was the one that uh, took some action uh, towards Gonzalo. Investigators uncover a troubling detail about Oscar's life. It was discovered that Oscar Rodriguez's mother uh, lived right next door to uh, the victim's family. The investigation kind of perked up as far as focusing in on Oscar, given the fact that he, he had such access to Gonzalo. Detective suspicion grows further when they speak to Oscar himself. When Oscar Rodriguez was interviewed, he lied to us and told us he had not had any contact at all with Bobette and didn't really know anything about what was going on. When we started to confront him that this was in contradiction to the information that we had from Bobette, he became furious, started yelling at us, you don't trust me. He stated he had no claims to continue any relationship with Bobette and uh, he wanted to wash his hands of this entire investigation. Because of his nature, he just drew suspicion upon himself. He was asked if he'd take a polygraph to show that he didn't have anything to do with Gonzalo's murder. He became very volatile and immediately demanded to end the interview. Then actually stormed out of the interview. With Oscar not cooperating, detectives investigate his whereabouts during the time of the murder. During this time frame, Oscar Rodriguez was actually serving a sentence in the restitution center. The restitution center is a work release facility for low to mid-level offenders, where Oscar could get passes to go out and find work. So the question was, did Oscar have a pass at the date and time of the murder? Was it possible that he wasn't in the restitution center? He is on a strict timeline. He had to check in, check out. It's a secure facility. The building is locked. There are alarms on all the doors and windows. At the restitution center, there is a lockdown period at night until early in the morning. After the records were examined, it was positively concluded that he was in the restitution center at the time Gonzalo was killed. It was impossible for him to have been involved in the actual homicide and ultimately he was ruled out as a suspect. It's been a week since the murder, and the investigation is no closer to finding a suspect. Meanwhile, the family prepares to bury their beloved Gonzalo. It was really hard on everybody. My mom decided she wanted to take him to Mexico. He was buried over there, and we all stayed for a while, trying to grieve together as a family and process what had just happened to our family. My mom was just devastated. It hurt me so much to lose Gonzalo. I was grieving deeply. I was in denial. I was in my own world. And I don't even know how I got by. While the family grieves in Mexico, the community of Cornelius is feeling on edge. 
There wasn't a quick arrest within a, you know, a couple days or a week. This caused concern in the community because no one knew who did it. Searching for new leads, detectives turned to the public. We decided to put out a reward for information. And the idea was to get people to come forward if they knew anything and let them know that we're a little bit frustrated with where this investigation is going. We need public help. Nearly two weeks after Gonzalo's murder, police get a tip that sends the investigation in a whole new direction. We got a call from an employee of the uh, SB gas station. His name was Ryan Petty. He claimed that he had seen some graffiti written in the bathroom of the gas station. And the graffiti said, Gonzalo Guzman, 12th Street Gang, please help, call the police. And once he heard about the reward, he put Gonzalo with that name Gonzalo and recognized it must be the same victim who, uh, who had left that, that cry for help on the wall. Detectives rushed to the gas station to interview Ryan. While interviewing him, he divulges a shocking revelation. So what called his attention to the bathroom was shortly before he saw a car pull up, a white Monte Carlo, uh, that had, in his words, skinheads in vehicles. One of them allegedly had a swastika tattooed on his body. They were accompanying a very scared-looking Hispanic young man. He stated that it looked like that Gonzalo may have been kidnapped. That was significant in the fact that we felt this was a big break that came in the case. Nearly two weeks after Gonzalo Pisano Guzman was found brutally murdered, a gas station attendant named Ryan Petty has told police he saw Gonzalo with three suspicious men the night he was killed. He described a carload of skinheads that uh, had drove up and a young man in the back seat who appeared frightened and they escorted him into the men's restroom uh, for a short period of time. He said that ultimately out of the bathroom, the Hispanic individual came out and they hustled him back into the car and drove away. So Ryan Petty reported that uh, when he went into the bathroom after the an individual left it, he saw written on the wall, Gonzalo Guzman help a 12th Street gang call police. But as detectives dig into Ryan's story, some details don't add up. Had it been Gonzalo who had gone into that bathroom afraid for his life and put his name on the wall, he never would have written his name as Gonzalo Guzman. We knew that was incorrect. He would not sign his name in that nature. That was the maternal name. He would have used the paternal name. Guzman is his mother's name. He would have written his name as Gonzalo Pazano. Pazano is his father's name. And so right away, this was suspicious. And just the whole nature of what he was describing was more like something off of a TV show. The skinheads, the swastika, it just didn't ring true. And so it was suspected that he was trying to come forward for the reward. We looked through the uh, videotape from the SB station during the period of time this employee stated that car had gone by. There was nothing in that videotape that corroborated anything he had told us. No white Monte Carlo, no individuals who could be characterized as skinheads, more importantly, no individual who was a scared Hispanic person being escorted to the bathroom. The examination of the surveillance video at the gas station contradicted Ryan Petty's uh, version of events. And also, one of the issues was he didn't report this right away. When police check Ryan's record, they find more troubling news. He had a pretty checkered past. He was no stranger to the criminal justice system. Some of his arrests were for crimes that would cause you to doubt his honesty. In my mind, we rule it out as pure fabrication. It just was too cute, too stereotypical. The mistake with the Spanish surname, I didn't buy it. With another lead exhausted, investigators face a daunting realization. We reached a point where we were getting nowhere. Leads weren't panning out. Having no 
significant suspect is very depressing. Really, if you don't solve these cases early on, the longer they go, the likelihood that you're actually going to be able to solve them um, becomes less and less. In cases like this where we're not getting anywhere, especially on a homicide, we took this very personal. Up to that point, this team had not had an unresolved homicide. The lack of progress also adds to the pain suffered by Gonzalo's family. It was very hard. It was very painful to come back from Mexico, and there was no arrest yet. Fue algo fuerte para mí. Mucho dolor. Tenía mucho coraje y mucho odio en mi corazón. Everything was very silent, and we were getting very, very impatient. My mom was getting very impatient with the detectives, and all they told us is to please trust them. So we put our life in their hands. Two more months pass without an arrest. With the case at a standstill, detectives review the entire investigation for something they may have missed. It can be very frustrating when you reach that point where you've kind of hit the wall, but you just have to resolve to redouble your efforts and to keep digging, keep pushing. It was time to go back and look over everybody one more time. We knew that Eddie and Jaime were the last people to see Gonzalo at Saul's house the night of the murder. Even though they'd been interviewed and gave a pretty good account of their activity that night, their boss, Rafael, provided an alibi for them. We wanted to be sure. So at this stage is when we asked them to take uh, a polygraph. But when we began to ask them to take a polygraph, they started dodging and weaving. For some reason, they began to balk, and this threw a red flag as to why they weren't coming forward. Again, these are the last two people to see Gonzalo alive, and now they're uh, getting cold feet about taking a polygraph exam. And that's when we really started to think something was wrong. Detectives keep the pressure on Jaime and Eddie, and on September 14th, Eddie comes in for his polygraph. The polygrapher was hooking Eddie up, attaching these leads to him to measure his response. And uh, he doesn't even get to the questions. And Eddie says, OK, I'll tell you what happened. And he immediately makes it clear that he wants to tell everything that happened. In police parlance, he spilled it. Two months after the murder of Gonzalo Pisano Guzman, detectives are re-interviewing witnesses, hoping for a break. Now, Eddie, one of the last people to see Gonzalo alive, has told police he knows more than he's let on. He gave a detailed, recorded statement about what happened on the night of the murder. As he talks to investigators, Eddie drops a bombshell. He disclosed that he had actually been approached by his boss, Rafael, who was Saul's brother, to coordinate delivering Gonzalo to the Forest Hills Country Club parking lot. Eddie told us that it had all been planned out by Raphael. Raphael had enlisted Joe Noble to help with this crime. Joe was Raphael's friend. Eddie went on to tell us that night, he and Jaime lured Gonzalo to drive his car to the golf course. And as they pulled up, Joe Noble, appeared with a gun in his hand. And as Eddie and Jaime got out of Gonzalo's car, Noble got into the car, pointing the gun at Gonzalo. And also present in the parking lot was Rafael and his white Ford F-150. Gonzalo was driven away by Rafael and Joe, but Eddie claims he has no idea what happened next. He stated that he and Jaime had left the country club and got into their vehicle, left and went home and went to work as usual. Could the brother of Gonzalo's fiance, Saul, really be behind his brutal murder? It was extremely surprising to suddenly see Rafael Mora as somebody different than this really incredibly self-possessed 19-year-old who started his own business. But according to Eddie, Raphael leads a disturbing double life. Eddie told us that Raphael was a pretty active drug dealer. The nice entrepreneur 
cover of Raphael was all a lie. He's a significant drug dealer, and it appears orchestrated the kidnapping of Gonzalo with Joe Noble. This completely surprised me. Raphael did appear, at least on the surface, to be legit, and now he's just not who we thought he was. It was a shock to all of us. The one thing detectives still need to know is why Raphael would want to kill his future brother-in-law. Up to that point in time, there was nothing to link him. There was, there was no motive that anybody could speak of. Investigators first turned their attention to Joe Noble, suspecting he may have been taking orders from Raphael. Joe Noble was uh, known as a small-time criminal. An informant told us he was very concerned about a 40 caliber pistol he had sold to Joe Noble and he suspected that this may have been the murder weapon used in the killing of Gonzalo. That's not the last of the informant's revelations. He said that Joe Noble had talked to a female at one of the local bars and had asked her to alibi for him on that particular night in question. We contacted her. She told us that yes, Joe had asked her to say he was with her on the night of the 6th and most importantly, she said, I wasn't with him. Police bring Joe in for questioning. Joe denied having any involvement whatsoever to the murder. During our interview with Joe, he actually tried to use the alibi. And then when we confronted him with the fact that we'd already talked to her and she said it was all BS, then he stopped talking. Joel stated that he wanted an attorney and didn't want to talk anymore. With nothing concrete to hold Joe, Police are forced to release him and turn their attention to Raphael. Investigators learned that Raphael's cleaning business was not all that it was purported to be. He had a contract with the Hawthorne Farms Athletic Club. The manager of the health club was not very impressed with the quality of Raphael's work and the work of his crew. It was really a shoddy operation by all accounts. We considered the fact that the cleaning company may have been a front for Raphael's drug dealing. Raphael told police he was cleaning the gym with Eddie and Jaime the night of Gonzalo's murder. So investigators check with management in order to corroborate his alibi. The manager of the club said he often couldn't reach him. So he had no idea if he was there or not on the night of the murder. With his alibi falling apart, detectives ask Raphael's sister, Saul, why he might want Gonzalo dead. Saul admitted that Raphael had had a serious talk with her and that it was clear that he was opposed to the wedding, felt she was too young. Raphael did not want Gonzalo marrying Saul. Just did not see Gonzalo as being worthy of marrying into the family. Investigators learned that Raphael would mock Gonzalo for the car he drove. He'd mock him for bringing over a bottle of wine to his parents that was cheap and, and not any good. Raphael held an extreme dislike for Gonzalo. When accompanied by friends, he would go by Gonzalo's car and talk about keying it or smashing a window out and laughing about it. With the evidence against Raphael stacking up, Police are ready to bring him in for an interview. But there's just one setback. He disappeared. At this point, it's become pretty apparent that Raphael's got something to hide. When you put it all together, there was probable cause to arrest him. With a warrant for Raphael's arrest, police initiate a manhunt. He had a girlfriend named Sandy Montez. We found him hiding at his uh, girlfriend's house. He had dyed his hair orange. And it was obvious that he had done it to try to change his identity. On September 28, 2000, Raphael is officially charged with first-degree kidnapping and aggravated murder. I was, like, in shock. I had so much anger at Rafael. It's an anger I can't explain. Just when police believe they have their man, the investigation takes another shocking turn. We had Rafael in custody when uh, his girlfriend showed up with evidence stating that there is no way he could have been at the murder scene. This raised some obvious concerns. Could it be possible that Rafael was not involved in Gonzalo's murder? 
it came as an absolute surprise. Police have arrested Rafael Mora in the death of his sister's fiance, Gonzalo Pisano Guzman. But now, Rafael's girlfriend, Cindy, claims she has an alibi for him on the night of the murder. Cindy produced a receipt from a auto detailing place that uh, purported to have dropped off Rafael's vehicle the night of the murder and that Rafael was there and signed for it. It was presented as a solid piece of evidence that Rafael was working at the athletic club the night in question and they had the receipt to prove it. And an individual named Cassandra who owned the company had signed off and was going to be an alibi witness. Checking the validity of the receipt, police interview Cassandra, who admits to being a friend of Raphael. With a little bit of prodding by the investigators, uh, she finally admitted that, in fact, the receipt was fake. She confessed it was all a lie, orchestrated by Raphael. It was something that she dummied up because Raphael uh, had asked her to. With Raphael's alibi discredited, Investigators turn up the heat on co-conspirator Joe Noble. He told the officers that he hadn't been completely honest. He admitted that he was at the parking lot at the golf course. He was there when the car was burned. He admits the kidnap. He admits to pistol whipping the victim. He said that it was Raphael ordering him to do that. They then picked up Gonzalo, put him in the back of a Ford a white pickup truck. And then Raphael drove Joe home with the victim knocked out in the back of the truck. But when he last saw Gonzalo, Gonzalo, uh, albeit knocked out, was still alive. And then supposedly Rafael would have then driven back out to Hag Lake and killed Gonzalo. Detectives have a hard time believing Joe was not there when Gonzalo was finally killed, but have no proof. We had no physical evidence that we could link them to the crime, and it was frustrating. Desperate, investigators obtain security footage from businesses along the route they believe Raphael and Joe would have taken to and from the murder. Something on one of the tapes grabs their attention. We saw Raphael's pickup pull into the gas station to get gas. And lo and behold, there's Joseph Noble getting out of the white Ford and going into the gas station. And the timing of the gas station surveillance footage indicated that would have been probably shortly after the murder. Police also obtain a warrant for Raphael's phone records. Raphael insisted all along that he couldn't have committed the murder because he was miles away cleaning the gym. And lo and behold, at the time of the murder, his phone was not bouncing off the nearest tower to the athletic club, it was bouncing off the nearest tower to Hag Lake, which puts him in the area of the murder. That was huge. I felt ecstatic because I knew in that moment that we had him, and it absolutely conclusively meant that his alibi at the athletic club was false. This was a big moment of actually having some physical evidence. There's a great deal of satisfaction to having found the truth. With the new evidence in hand, prosecutors are confident they can secure a conviction. And in 2003, Joe Noble and Rafael Mora are tried together. Both were charged with uh, aggravated murder and with kidnapping in the first degree. At trial, prosecutors present a picture of what they believe happened to Gonzalo the night he was murdered. Rafael did not want him marrying his sister. Rafael was determined to have Gonzalo killed. And so he hatched a plan to get Gonzalo out to the golf course. Lured Gonzalo out there with Eddie and Jaime. After getting out of the car, Gonzalo was beat and pistol whipped and thrown into the back seat of the pickup. Rafael or Joe then set the car on fire and they proceeded to Hag Lake. They drove to an isolated spot. Gonzalo got out of the car. The gun was pointed at him. We believe that he was shot multiple times by Joe. And that Raphael was the one that wanted to get the 
final word in and stabbed him multiple times in the heart. On the stand, a witness reveals Raphael bragged to him about the murder. That Gonzalo was begging for his life, that Gonzalo was promising that he would stop the relationship with Saul, that he would move to Mexico. Mató a mi hijo de esa manera tan cruel. Gonzalo no se merecía esa muerte tan fuerte, nada más para que no se casara con Marisol. No one deserves to be killed that way. No one. It was so senseless. It was so senseless. On April 28, 2003, the jury finds Rafael and Joe guilty of Gonzalo's murder. Joe was sentenced to life with the possibility of parole after 25 years. Rafael was sentenced to straight life, no possibility of parole. After five years in prison, Rafael appeals his conviction, arguing ineffective counsel. The judge decided that this case should go back to trial, which was a shock to all of us. Ultimately, a decision was made to allow Rafael to plead to manslaughter in the first degree. Rafael's sentence is reduced to 25 years and 10 months. With time served, he will be eligible for early release in 2024. He had no remorse, he had no guilt. He's a monster. Because <laughs> what he did to us changed our life forever. He destroyed us. Even after everything they've endured, Gonzalo's family remains inspired by his memory. Yo lloré por muchos años, mucho tiempo, y un día yo lo soñé. Yo estoy bien mal. No llores por mí. Yo estoy muy bien. Y yo lo miré riéndose y me dijo que ya no llorara por él, que él estaba bien, que él estaba en paz. He was a happy person that wanted everybody around him to have that same joy and made sure that we were always laughing. Those are the moments that I will always cherish the most. Gonzalo was one of the most genuine men that I've known. A cherished family at the center of a small town. They laughed and they joked around and they were happy together. They were loved and well-respected in our community. Is gunned down in cold blood. I'll never forget walking in the house that morning and seeing what I saw. Who could have done this? Was it somebody that they knew? Maybe this person had sought some type of revenge. Detectives pursue a trail of suspects. He was actually set to gain from the death. And then his behavior was alarming. During the polygraph, he started tearing the stuff off. I know they had had issues within their relationship. They said, well, I can take care of that problem for the right sum of money. But the killer remains elusive. What are we missing? What are we not doing? Until a shocking confession reveals the true culprit. And she agreed to wear a recording device and elicit some more information. I mean, it was just incredible. It was disturbing. The killer was about the most unexpected thing. It was such a shock. Columbia, Kentucky is a small but tight-knit rural community. Everyone knows everyone else. Your neighbors uh, feel like family. People watch out for one another. Not uncommon. You'd be walking downtown. You'll stop, run into friends or family. Very uh, friendly atmosphere. One of the most beloved families in Columbia are the Wellnitzes. They own a veterinary clinic just steps away from their home. I just remember that environment at the clinic was a place that I, as a kid, wanted to spend every spare moment that I had just because it was, it was a great place to be. Joe and Beth, their kids, Dennis and Meg, they were kind, they were loving, and they were fun to be around. On February 26, 1993, the town forever changes after two of Joe and Beth's employees make a grim discovery just after 8 a.m. at the Wellnitz home. Two employees had shown up for work, but Joe and Beth were not at the clinic. The clinic was adjacent to the residence. 
So the gentleman walked over to the house, went in the back door, and discovered Joe's body in the, uh, in the downstairs area of the home. The lady that had also shown up for work that morning, she then went to the house, uh, discovered two bodies upstairs. Joe and Beth and their son, Dennis, they've been shot. Then she ran out and called the police. Investigators rushed to the scene. I'll never forget walking in the house that morning and seeing what I saw. It was just total shock. I knew what kind of people they were. I knew how kind they were and how compassionate they were with their work that they did. It's, I couldn't believe it. When we entered the house, there was Joe laying there on the floor. He was on his stomach. His hand was underneath his chest. He had a pair of, of, of gray sweatpants on and a, and a white T-shirt. It looked like he came out of a bathroom and had been shot and fell face first. Blood that had pooled around the body. My initial reaction was shock. But then I realized uh, shortly thereafter that I had a job to do. And my job was to take care of the scene to uh, see if we could find out who did this horrible thing. Around the scene where Joe was found, there was multiple shell casings, and you could see bullet holes in the wall. We went from there to the uh, uh, upstairs, and we found Dennis's body laying there in his bedroom. He had no shirt on. You could see bullet holes in his back. Uh, there was also shell casings laying around. Looked like he was crawling on the floor and was executed by the killer at that point. Entering into the back bedroom that belonged to Joe and, and Beth, you could uh, see multiple shell casings back there. Beth was found on the side of the bed nearest to the doorway. She appeared to have been standing when she was shot with multiple gunshot wounds to her head and upper torso. The Wellenses were all found either in or near a bed or in clothes that suggested they had been sleeping. So it was apparent that it had happened during the night at some point or early morning hours. After examining the bodies, police scour the rest of the house for clues, but there's no sign of a murder weapon. There were no broken windows. There was no furniture turned over. The house had not been ransacked. It was significant that, that there was no forced entry that at least gave the impression that it was somebody with some degree of familiarity with the home and with the wellness family. It appeared this family had been targeted. Who could have done this? You know, who is the person that uh, that would have done such a horrible crime in this community that uh, that is usually so gentle? Was it somebody that they knew? Maybe this person had sought some type of revenge. Once we saw that these three people had been murdered, we immediately wanted to know where is Meg Wellness at, so we can find her to make sure she's safe. First of all, make sure she's not a victim. We were able to locate her. She was at school in Lexington and uh, was unharmed. Officers are tasked with breaking the news to Joe and Beth's daughter. Meg was told that her mom and dad and brother were, were murdered, were dead. I really felt sorry for her. I thought, now how is she gonna go on? You know, how does she recover from this? We got a phone call just a little while after I got up and they said, Beth and Joe have been killed. And at that moment, we didn't know Dennis also had been killed. And I just stayed in my room that day and just cried. Just couldn't believe that they were gone. They were like a second set of parents for me. One of my family members had called. They uh, gave me the horrible news that, uh, that Joe and Beth and Dennis had all been uh, murdered. And that's, uh, that's a day you don't forget. Joe Wellnitz was born in 1942 and grew up in Louisville, Kentucky. From a young age, he always loved animals and turned that passion into a career. Not many rural communities anywhere would have been able to boast of having a veterinarian with the uh, background that Joe had. Joe was one of the most caring, kindest,
gentleman that you will ever meet. In his 30s, Joe met Beth Preston, a woman 10 years his junior. Both divorced, they married in 1979, and Joe adopted her two kids, Dennis and Meg. Two years later, they moved their family and Joe's clinic from Lexington to Columbia. Meg would come in and out of the clinic. Dennis would mostly, I would just see him outside. He was only 20 years old. Dennis was popular in school. He had worked in town. He had attended college. He was a uh, just a well-liked young man. Beth was the one I was closest to. She was the face of the clinic. She was the person everyone saw when they walked in the door. Always had a smile on her face. The relationship between Joe and Beth was perfect to me. They laughed and they joked around and they were happy together. They were a very happy family. But one horrific night has changed everything. Who could have wanted to kill the Wellnitzes and why? The two employees that discovered the bodies were certainly interviewed that morning. There was really no motive. And the way the two of them arrived that morning, there was really no opportunity for either of them to commit the murders. They were dismissed as suspects. In Lexington, police ask Meg to help them piece together her family's last movements. She says she visited them for dinner two days ago, but had returned that night as she had school. Meg told the police that she'd been in Lexington the night before the bodies were found, and that she'd been playing cards with some friends, her boyfriend, uh, as well as another couple, Bill Meese, and then Bill Meese's wife. When asked if Meg was aware of any problems at home, she gives police their first lead. There was a couple that were tenants of Joe and Bess. They may have had issues with, and uh, their names, Brenda and Dave Cowell. The Cowells had been living in a cabin on the Wellnitz property. They were living there rent-free, exchange for doing some work for uh, Joe and Beth. There was some discrepancy there about whether they were doing the work sufficiently or not. Joe and Beth felt like they weren't, so they gave them a bill for $1,800 for the rent. And uh, ultimately, they never paid it. They filed bankruptcy. Were the Cowles angry enough to want the Wellnitzes dead? Was this murder payback? They were persons of interest, people that we needed to talk to. We needed to prove or disprove whether they were involved in it or not. Coming up, fear races through the community. We thought if this could happen to the Wellnesses, it could happen to any of us who would be next. People were scared. Everybody wanted to know who did it, why they did it, and how they did it. Everybody was just guessing, you know, gossiping. And police unearthed family secrets, indicating a potential motive. It was a surprise to me to learn that there was another child involved. There was actually a will giving him so much money out of the estate. Before a shocking confession. Reveals a killer no one could have imagined. It was a bombshell, couldn't believe it. Police investigating the homicide of Joe, Beth, and Dennis Wellnitz have their first suspects, tenants who had recently clashed with the family over money. When we learned about the bankruptcy, about the uh, uh, them living on the property, this discrepancy about the work they were doing, whether it was sufficient or not, you know, especially when it came to the money, and then this bill for $1,800, you know, we thought, well, this could be a motive for them wanting to do something. We knew that we had to talk to them. Uh, we had to see if they were involved. Police learn the Cowles no longer live on the Wellnitz property. Maybe they left there disgruntled. We went on that theory. Maybe they had went to the Wellnitz house that morning and then got into it with them, and then that's when all this escalated from there. While detectives tracked down the Cowles, Officers canvassed the area for witnesses. We did a neighborhood canvas to talk to people to see if they, anybody in that area had heard anything, seen anything, or had any other information that they could provide. We were not able to, to identify anybody that did hear anything that went on that night during the shooting or anything. Four days after the murder, 
Detectives locate the cowls and bring them in for separate interviews. Brenda claims she didn't hold any grudge against the Wellnitzes. She told us that even though they had not paid the money that uh, Joe and Beth felt like they owed, they had worked out the discrepancy and everything had moved on from that. Police asked Brenda where she was the night of the murder. They ended up moving off the farm. She said she was not there. She was at home when it happened. When detectives speak with Brenda's husband, Dave, he's unable to confirm her alibi because of his own. Dave was working in Louisville, Kentucky, which is uh, almost in Indiana, probably 100 miles from where this happened at. He adamantly denied any involvement in this. He didn't want to do harm to them. Investigators speak to friends of the Wellnitzes to confirm the dispute with the Cowles had been resolved. When we were talking to, to friends in that area, we were able to determine that that situation where those hard feelings were had been resolved a long time prior to this happening. They were ruled out as far as having anything to do with this murder. With no arrests made, fear begins to grip the town. We thought if this could happen to the Wellnitzes, it could happen to any of us. It could happen to anyone. They were loved and well-respected in our community. And so if they could be killed, who would be next? People were scared. Everybody wanted to know who did it, why they did it, and how they did it. Word travels fast. Everybody was expressing their opinion as to what may or may not have contributed to this. But everybody was just guessing, you know, gossiping. It's got the whole community in an uproar about what happened. We had to get some answers pretty quickly, make sure that it wasn't some random killing and that other people may be coming next. When we started thinking about who could have done this, we started thinking about the veterinary business. People get very sensitive about their pets, and we thought, well, maybe somebody had uh, gotten disgruntled over that. We learned from the employees there that uh, there was an issue between Jerry Yarberry and, and the Wellnesses where he had brought in his dog to have treatment done to its eye and the dog ultimately was blind. So we thought, well, maybe this might be a motive for somebody to do harm to them. Some of the key questions that we wanted to know from, from Jerry was, how did he feel now toward, toward the Wellnesses and how did he feel toward what had happened between them? Police bring Jerry into the station for questioning. He told us that he he was very upset about his pet. He refused to pay the bill that was owed uh, to the wellnesses. They ended up having to file a, uh, a lawsuit against him in order to recoup the funds. While Jerry admits he was angry with Joe, he says he isn't a killer. He, adamantly denied doing anything to the wellnesses as far as going to that extreme. When we talked to Jerry, we uh, we learned that he was home watching TV with his wife and kids, and we were able to, to confirm that that's where he was at, and there, therefore we were able to eliminate him as a suspect in this case. There's frustration on the part of the police because they want to see a crime solved. They want to see a murderer, in this case, held accountable. They want to see that person punished. And then there's frustration because we don't know if justice is ever going to be served. As the case threatens to stall, a friend of the Wellnitz family contacts police with pertinent information. I said, I'm a real estate broker, and they are getting the property ready to sell. There was an indenture, kind of a rectangle, in the floor of that master bedroom closet. I knew for a fact Joe and them kept a floor safe upstairs in their bedroom in the closet. I'm assuming, but that's where he kept all these important papers. His deed, anything that was of significance. Gives you the opinion that the safe was part of the plan all along, that, they, that the killer knew where that safe was at. It was not setting out in the open where you would commit these three murders and say, okay, there's a safe, I'm gonna take the, that with me. It was hidden back in a, in a closet. It certainly caused the officers to focus their attention on who would want that safe, who would know the safe was there, and who would stand to have some benefit from removing the safe 
especially in light of the fact that nothing else was taken, nothing else was disturbed. If we could locate that safe, and very easily that's going to put us on the trail of whoever committed this crime. Police investigating the first triple homicide in Columbia, Kentucky, are searching for an object stolen from the scene they hope will lead them to the killer. The missing fire safe was, was certainly a, a critical piece of evidence that the officers were investigating. They tried to determine more specifically what the contents of the safe were, what was in there, what was going to perhaps turn up that might then be a clue. In talking to the family, we were able to learn that there was possibly could be insurance papers in that safe, maybe even up to uh, around $1,000. In this case, the only motive was to either cause the death of, of the Weldon's family or to take the safe out. As detectives put out an APB for the safe, the autopsy results come in. One of the crucial things that we need to know is the time of death. As far as the time frame of the death, the internal examination of the bodies was consistent that they had been killed within a few hours prior to the bodies being discovered. It's estimated Joe, Beth, and Dennis were murdered around 4 a.m. The medical examiner was able to determine that, that each victim died as a result of multiple gunshot wounds. None of the victims had defense marks on their bodies, meaning they had likely been taken by surprise. Additional projectiles were recovered from the bodies during the autopsy. The firearms examiner did determine that all of the shots were fired from a 9mm handgun. It did seem likely that they were all fired by the same person, uh, given the fact that they were all fired from the same gun. Obviously, from there, we're going to start doing multiple interviews to try to eliminate or show who has killed these three people. Who could have that much of a grudge against them? During our investigation, we were able to learn that Joe had another son by the name of Eric. From my previous personal experience with Joe and Beth, I didn't know about Eric until after the murder. Joe had adopted him much the way that he did with Meg and Dennis, and then uh, that uh, marriage broke apart. It was a surprise to me to learn that there was another child involved that, that Joe had adopted at a, at a young age. We started uh, receiving information, documentation, showing that, that Eric was actually still uh, set to gain from the death of Joe. There was actually a, a will giving him so much money out of the uh, state to the tune of a quarter million dollars. Eric was somebody that we needed to talk to because that much money obviously would be a motive for somebody to do something like this. Police tracked the 19-year-old down at his home in Lexington. When uh, Eric was interviewed, he was shocked that it occurred. They had had uh, issues within their relationship, him and Joe. It was a very distant relationship and then non-existent after a while. Eric also indicated that he, uh, uh, he felt like he was replaced by Dennis. They had completely become estranged after so long and uh, had stopped any contact with each other. One of the things that we learned was that Eric did resent Joe. Part of that resentment was because of this estrangement. Had Eric settled a score and inherited a fortune by killing the family? When police question him about the will, they are taken aback by his response. When he learned that he was a, uh, a beneficiary to this will, he was uh, actually surprised that he was included in it, you know, because of the, they've been estranged for that many years. But detectives can't just take Eric at his word. The motive is there, the possibility, so we needed to know whether he had any type of alibi that we could substantiate to make sure that he wasn't in Columbia that morning. We learned during our interview with uh, Eric Wellness that he had worked that night, and then once he got off work, he went to a friend's house and slept at that friend's house. Eric says he was in Lexington the entire night, two hours away from Columbia. So we were able to talk to that friend and determine that he did not have the opportunity to commit this crime. We felt pretty certain that he was not a suspect at this point. 
we eliminated him and moved on. I, I was sh shocked, and uh, it was an odd situation being questioned by the police officers. The fact that I was named in the will, if that was something that I had known, then that for sure gives me a motive. But there's no way in the world I could have ever done anything like that. Yes, I was angry as a child, you know, having your dad disappearing out of your life, you know, kind of in a snap of a finger. It was hard, and I was angry, but uh, not that kind of anger where I wish, wished anything bad. Detectives learn that Meg, the only other surviving member of the family, is also named in the will. Could she have anything to do with the murder? I really felt bad for Meg at that time because I knew Meg, but we had to get to some answers. When we approached her about the will, she didn't know about it. She also wanted answers, you know. She loved them. Joe and Beth and Dennis, she was so bright and, and intelligent and loving. Police ask Meg about her relationship with her parents. She says it was good, but she raises one concern. Officers did learn that, that Beth and Meg had had some disagreements over uh, some of the people that she was now spending a lot of time with. One person in particular, Meg's boyfriend, Randy Appleton. Beth and Joe didn't want him around, so we needed to talk to Randy. Randy became a viable person of interest. After three members of the Wellnitz family are gunned down in their own home, police now have a new suspect, the boyfriend of surviving daughter Meg, 20-year-old Randy Appleton. Joe didn't go into any details, but he had a concern, I think, of the direction that Meg had taken as far as who she was associating with. That could be a, a motive for Randy Appleton. Detectives asked Randy where he was the night of the murder. He was leery about talking to us. Randy tells police he was playing cards with Meg and her friends until 2 a.m. the night of the murder. Then he mentions something that grabs detectives' attention. Uh, we learned that he, he was interested in, uh, in firearms. We had learned that he had frequented a firing range. If the murder weapon had been used at the same firing range where he, in fact, acknowledged having been, practicing with a nine millimeter would be a very critical part of the investigation if if those shell casings collected from the range matched the murder weapon that was believed to have been used to kill the Wellens family. We're starting to see red flags at this point. Randy was one that uh, liked uh, guns. He did like to go to that firing range and did use a weapon there. We actually ended up going to the firing range and uh, collecting several uh, spent shell casings all of them were submitted to the crime lab. Our hope was that uh, we could match those rounds uh, through the laboratory to some of the 9 millimeter shell casings that we had located. Two weeks later, police received the results on the shell casings. They were not able to find any casings that matched as having been fired from the murder weapon uh, that, that was used to kill the Wellens family. It was very disappointing that we were unable to tie any of those shell casings to Randy Appleton. It suggested either that they used a different weapon at the firing range than was used to, to murder the family, or that it could have been somebody else. Despite the setback, Randy's love of guns and familiarity with the Wellnitz home means he is still a suspect. Police look to confirm his alibi with those he and Meg claim to have been with the night of the murder. Bill and Regina Meese. We had to talk to them to see if that was what they were doing, playing cards during the early morning hours, because that was Randy's alibi. Bill was cooperative, where Bill had uh, agreed to talk to us about certain things. Bill corroborates Randy's alibi. They were all four together playing cards uh, till, you know the early morning hours. He agreed to take a lie detector test during the process of the polygraph, the polygraph examiner asked him if he knew anything about what happened, uh, if he had any involvement about what happened. 
And then his behavior was, was something that was alarming. It was something that caused some concern with the officers. We started tearing the stuff off that you put on during a polygraph and just shut it down right then. And then the polygraph was over at that point. So he did not complete the polygraph. He was just very mad. Definitely raised red flags with us that he knows more than he's telling us and that he's afraid of that polygraph because that polygraph might tell us more than he wants us to know. Despite his behavior, police have nothing concrete on Bill and are forced to let him go. We tried to talk to Regina, but Bill did not want us to interview her. He, you know, he was very controlling with her. It's over at this point. We were still running down leads. Obviously, you always get leads that you're going to follow. But uh, one of the things that I thought early on was if we ever get to a point where Regina and Bill are not talking, we need to go back and reapproach her. Lacking any new developments, months turn into years, leaving detectives and the Wellnitz's loved ones frustrated. What are we missing? What are we not doing? They're friends of mine, and this was one of those cases that you, you want to solve before your career is over. It was just like you were at a dead end, and we couldn't figure that out, you know. When the case went cold, it was very disheartening just knowing that someone had committed this terrible crime and that they may possibly never have to pay for that. I just remember feeling so sad. Beth and Joe were just such a light in our community. You don't have any answers when it happened. I had no idea of who could have done it or why they would have done it. There was so little information coming out. It just kind of fell to the wayside. It's just sad. The case remains cold for nearly a decade. But in 2002, detectives decide to take a fresh look at the triple homicide. This case is still on my mind. I had never forgot it. And I said, OK, what's the condition or what's the status of of uh, Bill and Regina. And I learned at that point that they were separating. That was the thing that we were waiting on before is when this separation occurred to go see what Regina had to say outside of the control of Bill Meese. Police track Regina down and what she has to tell them is shocking. When we met with uh, Regina in Lexington, she told us that she had proof of who killed the wellnesses. Nine years after the murder of Joe and Beth Wellnitz and their son Dennis, police finally have a break in the case. One of their surviving daughter Meg's best friends, Regina Meese, says she knows who the killer is and has proof. When we approached her, she immediately said, I've got this piece of evidence. She essentially wanted some assurance that she wouldn't be charged with tampering with evidence. And I assured her that if, if she, in fact, turned it over to law enforcement, I didn't think it would even constitute a crime. You know, at that time, we didn't know if she had photographs that perhaps were taken uh, during the commission of the crime. We didn't know if she may have had the firearm uh, that was used in the commission of the crime or what piece of evidence that she had. But she shared with us that she had, in fact, retained possession of the fire safe that had been removed from the back closet in the bedroom upstairs of, of Beth and Joe's home. When police asked Regina how she got the safe, she says the person who gave it to her is the one who shot the wellnesses. Regina is the one started the ball rolling. Everything started to fall in place. Regina told us that Bill Meese was the one responsible for the death of Dennis and the death of uh, Joe and Beth Wellness. It's very shocking, very shocking. She had been interviewed by the police before, but had been told uh, by her then husband, now ex-husband, not to talk to the police, not to tell them anything. And it certainly appeared at least to be a burden lifted that she was able to share this information it was a huge deal when we heard what she had to say. That was the part that we needed to happen, and that from there on, it uh, steamrolled from there. 
Regina takes police to her home to see the fire safe. It was the same type and everything that we were missing from the house that night. It was the same measurements, the same dimensions that we had measured when we were in the wellness house and discovered that the safe was missing. When we later compared the bottom impressions on that fire safe to the imprints taken from the uh, closet, it, it, was a, it was a perfect match. And, and in fact, it was the, uh, the fire safe that was stolen from the wellness home. Nothing of significant value is found in the safe. But Regina delivers another explosive revelation to police. She tells them that Bill is planning to kill again. Interviewing uh, Bill Meese's ex-wife, it came to the attention of the police that, that a mutual friend had had an encounter with Bill Meese where he had offered to kill her boyfriend. Bill had told her that he would commit this murder for her for $500. I mean, it was just incredible. It was disturbing. Was Bill some kind of twisted serial murderer? Police decide to move before he can strike once more. We initiated this investigation and... Uh... She did share with us that Meg had, had been involved in the planning of this murder and that she had wanted it done. Certainly that was shocking to everybody. She said that Meg had ridden with Bill Meese from Lexington down to Columbia late night, early morning when these murders occurred. Meg was a big part of the planning and the execution of the, of the plan at her parents' house. What we also learned is that they had been planning this three months prior to the murders, before they did it. We believed at this time that Meg and Bill Meese were the ones responsible for the murders. We had ruled out Regina and Randy Appleton at this time. It was a bombshell for us to, to learn that information. I couldn't believe it. Totally unexpected. Ten years after Joe, Beth, and Dennis Wellnitz were shot in cold blood, police now believe Meg Wellnitz wanted her parents dead and asked her friend Bill Meese to kill them. Based upon my prior history with Meg Wellnitz, I would have never dreamed that she would have been involved in that murder of her parents and siblings. She had become that type of person, uh, not the one that I knew from before. And now all of a sudden I see her in a completely different light when she has no compassion for life. Before they can lay charges, detectives need hard evidence against Meg and Bill. 
One of the things that we learned during the investigation, they had purchased a nine millimeter high power Browning automatic. We knew they had done that. They used a false ID and they used it to make the purchase of the gun. We were able to, to learn that through a, a report from uh, ATF and we actually identified who sold that gun to them and that uh, the person that sold it to them we actually identified Meg and uh, Bill as the, being the ones that came in. On February 27, 2003, detectives finally have the evidence they need. This case was presented to an Adair County grand jury, and the grand jury indicted both Meg Wellnitz uh, and Bill Meese. Meg is arrested at her home in Lexington, but refuses to speak to police. Bill, who is serving a 12-year sentence for the murder for hire plot, is ready to talk. During his statement, he certainly indicated to us Meg Wellness was involved in the planning. This was done at her urging. Uh, this was her idea and that she wanted it done. We agreed uh, that she wanted to have her parents killed. She claimed the estate was worth a million dollars. She would give me 10% of that, that estate in exchange for killing her parents. We had the motivation, the motivation being money. What we learned was that Meg and Bill drove from Lexington that morning down to Columbia and that uh, Meg gave Bill the key to the front door. She stays in the car. She does not go in the house. I walked through the house, the back room, showed him out of the back room. I engaged him fired on. He came toward me and I and he fired him. He fell. Uh, I went upstairs in the hall. Elizabeth was standing next to her bed. I came back down the hall. I entered Dennis's room. He was sitting on his bed. I engaged him. I emptied the magazine of weapons. He was still sitting up at that time. He was on the floor. He got on the floor and shot his gun. I then went into the back bedroom and into the closet. I got the fire box, took the box down in the car, took off the clothes I was wearing. I put all of those items, well, firearm, three magazines, in a black plastic trash bag. I put the black trash bag in the trash container, drove back to it. We got back to like about 6 30 or 7 30. It truly was a, a chilling account of, of just how cold hearted he was not only in doing it, but in talking about it. Police confront Meg with Bill's confession. She agreed to then give a statement. When we met with Meg, you know, my observation and my perception of her demeanor and her statements to us certainly was, was not one of any remorse. It was a matter of fact description of, of what she had done some years prior in having her family killed. I don't think I could have ever thought of Meg committing a murder or being a part of a murder plan. I know that life insurance might seem like a lot of money, but when you put that cost on lives, it's nothing. Like that's it's it's unfathomable to think that she considered their lives that invaluable. Bill Meese was convicted by a jury of three counts of murder, robbery, and burglary, and he was sentenced to death. Meg Wellness was convicted of complicity to three counts of murder, complicity to robbery, and complicity to burglary. And she received a sentence uh, of life in prison without the possibility of parole for at least 25 years. It's very disturbing to know that this little sweet girl that I remember has been the one that actually uh, played such a such a big role in uh, in the, in this murder. Meg orchestrated one of the most horrendous crimes that you could imagine, killing your mom and dad and also your brother. I do not think that Meg receiving 25 years was a just sentence. I think she was as guilty as Bill Meese, and I think she should have been given the same type of sentence as Bill Meese, death. For their daughter to have been 
the killer was about the most unexpected thing. It was such a shock to try to wrap your head around how could a daughter carry out or be the mastermind. It does not get any more heartless than that and it does not get any more sickening than that. She didn't deserve to ever be free again. In 2014, having served eight years of her life sentence, Meg is found dead in her cell of an apparent suicide. I certainly could never have imagined that things would have turned out this way. I just feel sad that Joe wasn't able to live out his life the way that he deserved to and continue to give back to the community that he was a part of and uh, be a father to Dennis and to Meg even. I, I wish I had gotten to spend more time with him. It's just hard to understand um, sometimes why, why things happen and why, why they had to lose their lives in that way when they had so much ahead of them. It was a very tragic ending. The community lost a cherished family. I mean, we miss them as friends. We miss them as, uh, as part of the community. They were just fine folks.
a vibrant and loving young mother. She was just an awesome person. She had a, a little feisty side to her because of the redhead, but she was always looking out for everybody else. Is found savagely murdered inside an office building washroom. There was insulated electrical wire used to strangle her. It appeared that there had been a sexual assault. Detectives pursue multiple suspects. There were problems with the marriage. They had had issues. They had been arguing. He was in the building the night she was killed. His prints matched the prints inside the bathroom stall. And hunt down an elusive killer. We talked to the attorney who states that he is probably somewhere in South America. I said, OK, where is he at? Can we get him? that no one could have imagined. I was in shock. I couldn't believe it. It was very unexpected to see him as the actual killer. Known for its live music scene, Austin, Texas is also one of the safest big cities in the country. Austin's kind of one of those cool vibe cities, and it's just a very good mix of people. There's a lot of green belts and parks and creeks and trails. It's a really, a really neat place to live. Austin has not had the kind of crime and the volume of crime as other large cities. People do typically feel safe. But in 1983, the town is rocked when a local businessman makes a gruesome discovery. In the early morning hours of September 20th, 1983, the Austin Police Department received a 911 call. One of the tenants of an office complex had come in in the morning and discovered things were out of place. There was a cleaning cart out in the hallway, so he went to try to find out if anyone else was still in the building. He did discover a deceased female in the upstairs men's restroom. The 911 caller did not know her name, but he recognized her as the woman who did clean the building. Police are dispatched to the scene. When we located the female victim in the men's restroom, she was positioned inside of the stall. She was undressed. There was insulated electrical wire that had small loops tied on the ends of them. Detectives believed that electrical wire was used to strangle her and be the cause of her death. It appeared because she had no defensive wounds at all that the killer came up from behind and surprised her. Everything in the crime scene suggested that this was a violent attack. There was wet toilet paper inside of her nose and her mouth it stands to reason the killer put that in her mouth and her nose after he strangled her to ensure that she was good and dead. There was a bodily fluid and a clothing that, that made it appear as if she was drug across the floor. Her clothes were scattered amongst the, the restroom, and it appeared that there had been a sexual assault. The victim was identified by an ID that was found inside of her purse. She was Lori Stout, a 22-year-old female from Austin. While forensics collect samples, investigators look for other evidence left behind by the killer. A significant fingerprint was located in the men's stall of the restroom. When dragging her in there, a person would almost have to brace themselves um, on the, the wall of the inside of the stall. The print inside the bathroom stall matched a print on the second floor fire escape. So the two of those were pretty significant. Had the killer fled through the fire escape after committing the murder? Detectives head down to the parking lot looking for more clues. They found that there was a spool that was used for insulated electrical wiring inside the dumpster. They also found some looser pieces of the same type of wiring that was used to kill the victim. 
Detectives bag the items for analysis. Back inside, police start piecing together a theory of who could have committed this horrible act. The fact that the victim was killed inside the building in the middle of the night suggested that whoever did this had access or a key to get in it. Detectives canvass the building and talk to employees, but determined that no one had seen anything suspicious. We were able to talk with uh, two witnesses that saw Lori at about 12.30 a.m. as they locked up and secured the building and left. We know that she was last seen alive around 12.30 in the morning, and the employee at the building discovered her body around 8 a.m. So she died sometime during that time frame. Just as investigators are finishing up, a frantic man arrives at the scene. He identifies himself as Gary Stout and demands to know where his wife, Lori, is. Gary Stout told detectives he woke up that morning and discovered that his wife was not home yet from work. He got worried and he drove up to the building, which was a short distance away, and discovered her car still in the parking lot. But it was surrounded by numerous police cars. It was at that point that the police spoke with him and broke the news that his wife was found dead. He was obviously uh, traumatized by what had happened. As police take Gary down to the station for questioning, the devastating news soon spreads to the rest of Lori's family. I was in shock. I couldn't believe it. My whole world changed. I no longer had my confidant, no longer had my best friend. It was horrible, horrible. When we found out that Lori had been killed, it was a big impact. It was overwhelming. Born in Arlington, Virginia in 1960, Lori Coffey was a naturally warm and caring soul. Laurie was the oldest of Laurie, myself, and TJ, but she was kind of the mother hen of us all. She had a, a little feisty side to her, and I think maybe because of the redhead, but she was always looking out for everybody else. She was just an awesome person. She really, truly was. Lori was the leader of us three musketeers, me, Beverly, and Lori. And she kept us going. After moving to Austin with her mother and siblings, in 1977, Lori met Gary Stout, who worked logistics for the military. It all flourished very fast. She was so giddy um, about Gary, and they fell in love. All in all, he just seemed like a good guy, so we were all, you know, okay, okay so this is it. After a whirlwind courtship, Lori and Gary married the following year. Three years later, Lori became pregnant. She was over the moon, very, very happy. I mean, that's what she wanted. She wanted to be married, start having a family, and she was on her way. But Lori is soon forced to face the harsh realities of military family life. Gary got orders to go to uh, Belgium. She was very sad. Lori was sad that Gary was gone overseas, and here she was facing having a baby on her own at home. On January 26th, 1982, while Gary is away, Lori gives birth to a baby girl. Lori had a really easy labor, and you know now we have this little baby, and uh, of course she was ecstatic. I think that she very much enjoyed being a mother. I think that she experienced um, probably the happiest months of her life after I was born. In order to spend more time with his family, Gary left the military and took a job as a maintenance worker in the same building where Lori worked nights as a cleaner. She was very excited that he was coming home. That's all she wanted, just to be a mom and wife, homemaker. With her life finally on track, how did this loving young mother become the victim of a cold-blooded killer? As with any investigation, you have to look at those that are closest to the victim and those that have motive. As an employee of the building, a maintenance worker there, Gary had access to them. Down at the station, police questioned Gary about his marriage to Lori. 
When we asked him about any problems in the relationship, he quickly admitted that they had had issues, they had been arguing, and were unhappy. Detectives discovered that Lori actually went and stayed with her sister, Beverly, shortly before the murder happened because of a really big argument that she had with Gary. Things were not going all that well for her and Gary, and she was miserable. This definitely created a concern that there were problems with the marriage. So knowing that he has access and motive, it raises the level of suspicion that he could have been involved in this crime. Coming up, detectives uncover disturbing secrets. He wasn't happy in his relationship, and he admitted that he was looking at leaving her. Lori's family felt very strongly that he was the killer. Before a shocking tip takes police in a whole new direction. We received information from a female victim of a man that committed a similar attack against her. This is a big turning point in the investigation. Could this be a, a serial rapist? Could it be a serial murder? And has detectives risking it all to catch a killer? We knew it was going to have to be something big for us to find him. We were holding our breath. We weren't sure it was going to happen. Police investigating the murder of 22-year-old mother Lori Stout are questioning their first suspect, her husband, Gary. When Gary was being interviewed, he was very forthcoming about the poor state of his marriage with Lori. So it was a little bit of a red flag. At this point in the investigation, we need additional information about problems that may be in their relationship. Laurie and Gary were happy. Um, when they first got married, she was proud to be a wife. That's all she wanted. But things changed when Gary returned from overseas. Laurie wanted it to just be like it was before he left. And unfortunately, that was not the case. So knowing the, the family's account of their relationship as well, knowing that it was a volatile relationship that created concern that he could have been frustrated with Lori and committed this, this type of act. When detectives press Gary for details about why his marriage was falling apart, he makes an alarming confession. He admitted that he had actually had an affair and was looking at leaving Lori. Gary tells detectives that he met a woman while overseas and that she had since come to visit him in Austin. At this point, the detectives are wondering, does Gary want Lori out of the picture given the very bad state of their marriage and the fact that he wants to be with this woman he's having an affair with? Gary explains that he ultimately chose to stay with Lori, but detectives become even more suspicious after they ask him for an alibi. He stated that the night before, he and Lori had an argument. So she went and slept on the couch. At one point, she finally just got up in the early morning hours, went to work. Gary did not have an alibi that we could confirm. He was at home with the young child, asleep. He could have left his house, gone up to the building and come back. That would not, not be something we could verify. So the marital difficulties, and now we've got a big fight, and Gary having access to the building. He's somebody that they're looking at pretty hard. Detectives ask Gary to provide samples of his blood and fingerprints to be compared with evidence found at the crime scene. He was cooperative with us. He provided uh, samples that were requested. Looking further into Gary's movements leading up to the murder, investigators reach out to his boss at the office building. The manager of the building informed the detectives that Gary had fixed a water heater uh, the day before Lori was killed. And he used the same type of electrical wiring that was used to kill Lori. This was uh, another extremely big flag in the case. All these things together really raise the suspicion that this is the guy. As police wait for forensic testing results, 
Lori's autopsy report comes in. Lori's cause of death was, in fact, strangulation. And that seemed to match the ligature found at the scene. What was determined is that a sexual assault had taken place. They were able to get a sample of semen. However, this is 1983, so there was no DNA testing available. In order to do any comparison, we used blood type antigens. This kind of evidence is helpful in narrowing down the field of suspects. When we found out how Lori was actually killed, it was disturbing. Uh, first thought to my mind, one sick individual. One very sick individual that did it. Pure evil. Absolute pure evil. Detectives eagerly receive the results of Gary's fingerprints and blood tests, but they are far from conclusive. Gary's fingerprints did not match the one inside the stall, but did match prints in the building. But he has access to the building, and he is working there. His blood type, it matches the type found in the semen. But of course, Gary is married to Lori, so it's another piece of evidence that can go both ways. Ultimately, we couldn't use fingerprints or, or any blood work to exclude him. Running out of options, detectives try one last method to get to the truth. Gary Stout was provided an opportunity to take a, a polygraph. During that interview, he was asked if he uh, was responsible for the murder of Lori, and he advised he wasn't. The results of that polygraph indicated that, that he was being truthful and there was no deception. Detectives were surprised that Gary passed the polygraph. Now, detectives have motive, they have access, but no evidence conclusively to show that Gary is, in fact, the killer. With nothing to hold him on, Gary is free to go. At this point, Gary is uh, not ruled out as a suspect, but he takes a little bit more of a backseat. Looking for new leads, investigators turn their focus back to the numerous employees who work at the building where Lori was killed. What's difficult, particularly about a public space like this, is so many people have access. We talked to everybody that uh, was a tenant in that building and started working our way through that process. Many of those folks were excluded based on fingerprints, evidence, everything else that could really put them to the side. But police learned that the building's tenants weren't the only ones who had access that night. We discovered that registration was being conducted from the University of Texas as satellite location at this office complex. And they stayed late after hours so that folks could come after work, sign up late into the evening. So this was uh, definitely something of interest for us. Detectives were able to get the names of the male students who had gone in that night, and they had them come down to the police department, and they got fingerprints um, of these individuals. Police process the fingerprints of over a dozen students and receive an alarming result. We were able to rule everyone out on the list with the exception of one. Um, we had a match, a fingerprint inside the uh, men's restroom as well as a fire escape door. So this person is somebody we, we want to talk to and interview. Detectives investigating the brutal murder of Lori Stout have just matched a set of crime scene fingerprints with someone who was in the building that night. The University of Texas was having a sign-up uh, registration at the satellite campus, which allowed people to come after hours uh, in the evenings after work in order to get signed up for classes. So we start going through the list of registrants. Detectives were able to determine that there was one student whose prints matched the prints inside the bathroom stall where Lori was found, and also on the fire escape door on that second floor. That individual was identified as Robert Van Wiese, and he was 18 years old. Investigators interview Robert about his movements on the night Lori was killed. He told us that he had been there for registration, and on his way out, he used the men's restroom upstairs. Once he was done in the restroom, he exited the fire escape because it was closer. 
to where his vehicle was parked, and which would explain why his fingerprints were found in the men's stall and the fire escape door. Robert Van Wieses did acknowledge that he saw the cleaning lady, which was our victim, Lori, after using the bathroom on the second floor before he exited the building. Robert tells detectives that he left the building at around 12.15 a.m. Before investigators look to verify his story, they ask Robert for a blood sample to compare to the semen found at the crime scene. Robert Van Wiese was cooperative. He gave the blood sample at the time, and the detectives submitted it for testing. There is nothing that we discover on Robert Van Wiese's criminal history or anything else that causes concern. He, it appears he's had no contact with law enforcement and no violent offenses in the past. He came from a family that is very well respected. His parents are pretty well-known surgeons in the Austin area. There didn't seem to be anything that would suggest him to behave in this kind of violent way. While they wait for the results, detectives look for anyone who can corroborate Robert's story. Detectives interviewed two employees of the education office, and they confirmed that they saw Robert Van Wiese leave the building at 12.15. We know Lori was still alive because there were witnesses that confirmed she was alive at 12.30. With Robert looking less and less like a viable suspect, his blood test results come in. The analysis of the blood sample told us that Robert was not a match to the bodily fluids found at the crime scene. The discovery means there is no hard evidence against Robert, and they are forced to let him go. Robert Van Wiese was ruled out and eliminated as a suspect. With no new leads, the investigation falters. As weeks pass with no arrests, fear in the community grows. The nature of the crime had created a lot of panic for residents, particularly females. It was difficult because there was no resolution. It left a lot of fear in the community. The police felt pressure to find out who was responsible for Lori's death. I mean, this was a totally innocent mother, 22 years old, taken from her family in a very violent attack. The people in and around that area where she was um, killed, they were interested in knowing what was going on. It was tough on our family. It is very frustrating. There's somebody out there that has taken a life, and you want that person to be held accountable. Anytime there's a crime committed like this, there's an in inherent pressure um, to solve it, to try to bring some closure and some comfort to the family and to the community. A person that could do something like this, that's not somebody that's going to stop at that one act. Typically speaking, that person is going to continue to hurt other people. We're always worried that, you know, he could he can continue to commit these kind of acts until he's brought to justice. One month after Lori's murder, police receive a promising new lead. We received information um, from a female victim of a man that committed a similar attack against her. The victim was sexually assaulted and strangled, but she was able to get away. He mistakenly thought she was dead, and uh, she was able to identify him. That person's name was Daryl Kemp. Daryl Kemp at that point was in prison, but he was not in prison at the time that Lori was killed. And so we started looking into this. We evaluated the information and started to determine if this could potentially be a suspect in, in this case. Police dig into Daryl Kemp's background and discover a disturbing pattern. It's determined that Daryl Kemp committed a attack in 1960, um, similar where the, the victim was uh, sexually assaulted and strangled. He was convicted for the rape and murder of a woman named Marjorie Hipperson in California. He did receive the death penalty for that. But later on, the death penalty got overturned. Ultimately, he was released and paroled in 1978. That's when Daryl Kemp moved to Austin. 
his M.O. matched. He's killed in this fashion before, and he was in Austin at the time. So this is going to be somebody that detectives look at pretty intently. Could this be a, a serial rapist? Could it be a serial murderer? We had questions that we needed to get answers to. One month after young mother Lori Stout was found raped and murdered in a bathroom stall, police are investigating a tip that she was the victim of convicted serial killer Daryl Kemp. Detectives at this time were, were thinking that Daryl Kemp was a, a strong possibility as a suspect because of the similar M.O., which was sexual assault and strangulation. Investigators learned that although Daryl is currently in jail for an unrelated crime, he was a free man at the time Lori was killed. Detectives head to prison to question him. The difficult part about interviewing somebody like Daryl Kemp is he's obviously been down this road before. He's got knowledge of how investigations work, and so information may be withheld or may not be genuine in his responses based on where he thinks or feels like your questions are leading him. Detectives start by questioning Daryl about where he was around the time of Lori's murder. They're asking him questions that would help tie him or connect him to the area that the building was located in. They ask if he knew where this building was, where he lived, basically to try to put him in a geographical area, figure out where he frequented. Daryl tells investigators he wasn't near the office building where Lori was killed and has no ties to the area. Daryl Kemp was asked if he was familiar with Lori Stout. He said he wasn't. Things that we're trying to pay attention to is whether his statements are truthful, does his body language support his statement, does it appear he's being deceptive, and is he forthcoming with his answers? Not trusting the word of a convicted killer, detectives shift gears. He was asked if he would take a polygraph. He hesitated with that because he didn't trust polygraphs. He is not cooperative at all. It's the same story when investigators ask him for his fingerprints and a blood sample. Again, he was very uncooperative. Based on all the evidence collected, we had enough information to obtain a warrant. Police collect Daryl's samples and eagerly wait for the results. When the results of the analysis were, were returned, it was determined that he was not the suspect in, in this murder. It's very difficult and frustrating because we're at a stalling point again. With no other leads, the case once again hits a wall. As the months turn into years, Lori's loved ones struggle with the lack of closure. Why are we not getting any answers? You know, give us something. I myself have been lost without her. Every time October 1st rolls around, First thing I think is, oh, it's Lori's birthday. Anytime when September comes around, when she was taken from us, it was, it's, it's not good. The suspicion that Lori's husband, Gary, was the killer continues to linger and causes a deep divide. My mother's family, even members of his own family, believed that my dad was involved. We all still had that suspicion that Gary had something to do with it. Eventually, Gary takes Dale and moves out of state. Gary, he didn't want to have anything else to do with us. So it was like, oh my God, now we can't see Dale. I lost my sister, but I also lost that connection with my niece. Being so young, she didn't really remember her mom. So it's probably, it was probably quite hard on Dale. When I was growing up, there weren't a whole lot of conversations about my mother. It was just the understanding of she wasn't there anymore. As Dale grows older, she begins to ask questions. My dad did not like talking about it. I did not have a family member sit me down and explain to me that this is what had happened to her. It wasn't until I got older, got access to the internet, that's when I learned that she was attacked that she had been strangled, that she had been raped, and then she had been murdered. It was very overwhelming finding out about it in that way. 
Lori's family continues to push for her killer to be brought to justice. We never gave up hope. We tried um, to keep it fresh and focused on it. We were constantly checking in. We had to get this case closed to help give our family a little peace. It just, it was overwhelming. The pressure finally pays off. And in 1992, nearly 10 years after Lori's murder, a new team of detectives reopen her case. Now we have new eyes looking at everything. They look at the crime scene photos. They read all the police reports. They look at the various people that were interviewed. Part of that process is to go back and look at, at old evidence. Are there things now that are available to law enforcement that weren't previously available? Is there testing that can be done? Now we're in 1992, so we have DNA testing, which is much more powerful. With that in mind, investigators revisit their prime suspect, Lori's husband, Gary Stout. So Gary was contacted again and provided a, a DNA sample, which was compared to that obtained at the crime scene. Police are hopeful that they'll finally have the evidence they need to make an arrest. But when the results come back, they are shocked at what they reveal. It was determined that Gary was not a match. So officially, he could be ruled out as a suspect and remove the cloud of doubt that had been hanging over his head for some period of time. I do believe that my father felt relief, but it was very difficult for him to talk about. With Gary cleared, cold case detectives go back over the old files, line by line. With any review of a case, you look at um, who's been interviewed, who's been eliminated. And what was discovered is that one of the reports that was provided as far as the blood typing uh, seemed to have an error. The documentation that was used to finalize the forensic report that excluded a suspect actually showed that there was a clerical error in that lab report. And that particular suspect should have been included as a suspect, not excluded. This is a big turning point in the investigation Ten years after wife and mother Lori Stout was savagely murdered, cold case detectives have unearthed a stunning error in the results of a blood test. That means a previously cleared suspect might not be innocent after all. What was discovered is that the report said the subject could be eliminated, but there was a clerical error in the document and it should have read that he could not be eliminated. This suspect is Robert Van Wiese, the 18-year-old University of Texas student. He was in the building the night Lori was killed, registering for a class. And he's the same person whose prints were found inside the bathroom stall and also on the second floor fire escape door. Detectives look into what Robert Van Wiese had been doing the last 10 years. Robert Van Wiese had no criminal history. Here we have this 18-year-old college student coming from a well-to-do family, parents who are professionals, seem to have a very normal, happy upbringing. He was cooperative. So that all combined with the report that we received, you know, naturally excluded him as a suspect. Could 18-year-old Robert really have committed such a brutal crime? In talking with witnesses, Robert Van Wiese is seen about 12, 15 a.m. and leaving at about 12, 30. They see Lori in the building uh, by herself. Detectives re-examine the fingerprints he left at the crime scene and notice something troubling. What they discover is that his story of exiting the building through that second floor fire escape door would naturally support fingerprints being left on the inside of that door, if, as if you're pushing it open to leave. But some prints of his are found on the door handle 
on the exterior of the door as if you're opening it to enter the building. What this told us is that he had obviously left the building, but he had also come back in. He would have been able to re-enter it through that same door if he had propped it open with something. The discoveries mean investigators need to talk to Robert, but there's a problem. We try to locate uh, Robert Ray and Weesey, but we're not able to. And we reach out to family members who are not cooperative. They provide an attorney's contact. Uh, we talk to the attorney who states that Robert Ray and Weesey is probably somewhere in South America. All evidence up to that point showed he was in the Austin area. And then he likely finds out that he once again is a suspect. And now we have DNA testing capability. So he flees. Fearing Robert has left the country, detectives scramble to find him. They interview dozens of his friends and family members, but no one is willing to cooperate. Before they can launch an all-out search, Detectives still need more proof that Robert's the killer. So they come up with a plan to obtain his DNA. With Robert Van Weesey having fled, uh, we cannot get a sample from him. But what we are able to do is get what's called YSTR testing accomplished. And that's familial DNA. And it's specific to the Y chromosome that all brothers and fathers would share. So since Robert Van Weesey has brothers, in the Austin area, that's something we can actually test. In order to obtain the sample, detectives conducted uh, surveillance with family members. And at one point, they observed one of the brothers discard a, a trash and retrieve it. Trash is not something you need to get a search warrant for because it's what's deemed abandoned. So detectives take specific items that would gather DNA evidence like razor blades and toothpicks. And they conduct YSTR testing. When the DNA tests come back, the results are conclusive. And lo and behold, it's a match. Finally, we're able to make a direct connection with Robert Van Weesey to the DNA found at the crime scene. It was surprising to know that a young male coming from the background that he did, had the ability to do this at such a young age. There were no red flags with him. And so it was very unexpected to see him as the actual killer. We finally had a name. It just totally broke down. And so you're trying to wrap your head around, how could an 18-year-old do something like this? It was shocking, because I was 18 myself at the time. I would have never have had that cross my mind. I said, OK, where is he at? Can we get him? And then that's when we learned that he was gone. Robert Van Weesey is charged with murder and unlawful flight to avoid prosecution. And a warrant is issued for his arrest. Investigators team up with the FBI and launch an international manhunt. The Van Weese family owned a lot of properties throughout Mexico. We conducted telephone toll analysis. We looked at financial records. We monitored travel of Van Weese's family. We did a tremendous amount of ground surveillance on locations where we thought he might be. There were some tips that the FBI received for sightings of Van Weese in Mexico in certain locations, but we weren't successful in locating him. Years pass with no sign of Robert, but detectives refuse to quit. All you want to do is bring the guy back so he can face justice and get some kind of closure for the victims. But even the FBI, we have limited access, limited resources, and Mexico is a big country. There's plenty of places for him to hide. It is very frustrating because for me, I've lived my entire life waiting for justice but also very cognizant of the fact that it may never happen. Then in 2016, the hunt for Robert Van Weesey takes a promising turn. Van Weesey had been on the run for 20 years, so I knew it was gonna have to be something big for us to find him. And so we discussed it and we said, Let, let's do it, let's go for it. On December 13th, 2016, 
the FBI places Robert Van Wiese on their top 10 most wanted list. This was huge for our case because it brings awareness, but also that comes with a $100,000 reward. So it was, it was exciting to know that we're making traction. Once we announced his addition to the FBI's 10 most wanted list, we again interviewed people that knew him and possibly knew where he was. Probably the most important interview was with Van Wiese's mother. We said, Robert is going to be arrested. He is coming home. The safest way is to turn himself in. I think the mother realized with the $100,000 reward, his name on the 10 most wanted list, that it was going to be insurmountable that he was going to get arrested. The pressure pays off, and a phone call comes in that changes everything. Robert Van Wiese's attorney contacted the district attorney's office to let them know that he wants to turn himself in. Thirty-three years after the murder of Lori Stout, her elusive killer, Robert Van Wiese, is ready to return to the U.S. to face justice. Robert Van Wiese's lawyer contacted the district attorney's office and started to inquire about possible surrender with a plea bargain agreement. Typically speaking, when someone is a fugitive, we do not negotiate. But circumstances in this situation are quite unique. Mexico will not agree to extradite to Texas if the death penalty is on the table. So we will not get him in our hands if he's arrested in Mexico unless we agree to not have death penalty on the table. Wanting a swift resolution, the district attorney negotiates a deal. Being a WC would agree to turn himself in, and they agreed to um, 30 years in prison. On January 26, 2017, police head to the Mexican border to meet Robert. The plan was for him to surrender, but we were holding our breath. We weren't sure it was going to happen. We're anxious that this is finally going to take place, but until we have Robert Van Wiese in, in physical custody, we can't let our guard down. The arrangement was that he would meet us at the halfway point on the pedestrian bridge. There's a line in the middle. On one side says Mexico, on the other side says United States. He was to meet us there at 1 o'clock. Um, he didn't show up. As the minutes tick by, investigators start to worry they've been duped. We had assurances from the attorney that he would show up, but at any point during that time, he could have turned around and changed his mind, and there was nothing we could have done. At 1.36 p.m., a lone figure approaches the border. He walked up very slowly, stopped at the line. He introduced himself as Robert Van Wiese. And I said to him, you ready to turn yourself in? He took a deep breath. He closed his eyes. He said, yes. I said, step on across. And he took one step over, and he was arrested. Seeing him walk across that bridge and seeing law enforcement put handcuffs on him, it was extremely satisfying. There had been so much work from so many different people over the years, that from 1983 up until 2017, now we have somebody that's accountable and be brought to justice was one of the um, most rewarding experiences in my career. I sent the picture to Dale and let her know we got him. And I, I get a text back that it apparently was Dale's birthday. So it was pretty emotional. She showed me a photo of Van Wiese being escorted into custody. It's kind of hard to believe that after all of these years that it would be that day of all days that he would turn himself in. It was, and it still is surreal that it finally did happen. I mean, it just emotions everywhere. I just can't, it's, it's finally over. It's finally over, finally over. The plea deal means Robert does not have to speak to investigators, leaving them to piece together how they believe the murder unfolded. 
He showed up that night to register for classes. He sees Lori as she's cleaning. It's possible that Robert Van Wiese and, and Lori Stout had an interaction as he passed her. Maybe she spoke to him. He goes to the bathroom, develops his plan on coming back in. He's opportunistic. The opportunity rose, and he left through that fire escape door on the second floor, propped it open. And once the other workers had all left, I think he came back in. When he came back in, he would have passed in the parking lot the dumpster that had some leftover electrical wiring that Gary Stout had used that day for the hot water heater and grabbed it and went upstairs and then attacked her, raped her, and killed her. Lori was killed in probably one of the most personal violent ways that someone can be killed. Robert Van Wiese is an extremely cold and calculating person. On March 28, 2017, Robert pleads guilty to Lori's murder and is sentenced to 30 years in prison. Lori's sister, Beverly, is there to deliver an emotional impact statement. I looked him right in the eye and told him what he had taken from our family and what it had done. And, I, you know, I just told him, I hope he rots in hell and gets to feel some of that terror that my sister felt that night. I know in my heart he is where he needs to be. I think Lori's family felt a sense of relief, a sense of closure that maybe now, at least my hope for them now with that is that they could at least start to heal. Him being arrested and incarcerated does bring closure. I think that that's what everybody dreams about when a crime like this happens to one of their family members. Still see Lori's face quite often. She was a hoot. Lori was a hoot. I miss her dearly. I do believe that my life would have been very different if she would have lived. And I know that she would have done anything to make sure that I had what I needed. I still think of Laurie every day, every single day. There were a lot of good times, good memories with Laurie. Um, and I just wish we would have had more. <laughs>